Okay, I am going to call the meeting to order. I see that uh, we have um, people here in the room and uh, also council members uh, participating by Zoom. Um, so I think uh, one of the things we'll need to do is uh, call on all the council me members who are appearing rem remotely to introduce them or identify themselves. I'll start. I'm Carrie Brown, District 3. I am Pilin Cohn, District 2. Sal Alfano, District 2. Lauren Hurl, District 1. Ah, great. Okay, and you said that you may have limited connectivity, so no video. Yeah, hopefully to hold that for that. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> start out by talking about meeting logistics, which are the same as always, which is that anyone particip who's participating remotely, we would ask you to uh, change your name on display to your first and last name so we can track who's here and who's speaking. Um, we will have an opportunity uh, for people to be heard on various items that are on the agenda by being recognized by the uh, by the chair and we would ask you to limit your uh, comments to two minutes um, we will also have an opportunity for uh, public comment but uh, but I think that's it for for now uh, next item on the agenda is to approve the agenda are there any changes needed to the agenda. Donna. I, I would like to discuss the council's uh, retreat. And that can be at the end of the meeting, but just so it's not missed. I'll, I'll write it in under other business so we can, so we don't forget it. And you also remind me if I, <laughs> if I start to, but I don't think I will. Um, all right. <coughs> Next, I, with the, I'll consider the agenda approved. Next item on the agenda is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any uh, topic that is not on tonight's agenda. We will uh, call on people in the room and uh, on, on Zoom, and we would ask you to limit your comments to three minutes in length. Um, Peter Kelman, I see you've got your hand raised, so uh, why don't you go ahead? Uh, thank you. Peter Kelman, I live at Mountain View Street. I'm on Pillar. I just want to say that I'm concerned about a number of matters related to the last city council meeting on May 10th. First uh, of all, on three separate occasions during that single meeting, I had my virtual hand raised and was waving wildly to be recognized and was not so recognized. One of those occasions was when the resolution proposed by the Homelessness Task Force passed without any discussion, despite the fact that I had my virtual hand raised and was waving my actual hand wishing to speak on that resolution. Nor is this the first time the chair has failed to notice my hand being raised. He needs to have someone he checks with regularly who is monitoring the gallery view, especially before he closes discussion and a vote is taken. Secondly, technical problems continue to plague city council and other uh, committee meetings. Council member Lauren Harrell was largely inaudible from the beginning of the last meeting until the break. Why did it take so long to recognize and to fix that by having her borrow her neighbor's uh, uh, mic? Uh, there was total loss of sound for a while. I have no idea how long it took for you guys to all realize what was said or what was said during that time because we just couldn't hear. As a result of the technical issues and the mayor's failure to notice my hand being raised, the following sequence of events unfolded. I wasn't able to hear Lauren's motion to approve the consent agenda, so I couldn't tell whether or not the Backman letter of agreement for a feasibility study on Barry Street Rec Center had been removed from the consent agenda, as I'd requested by email to the mayor, the city manager, and the council, in which I explained my concerns, and the mayor had emailed me that it would be removed. Then the mayor apparently wasn't seeing my virtual hand or me waving my hands to ask about that until the city manager indicated to him that I was doing so. I'd actually had my hand up for quite a while to make that request. 
Once recognized, the mayor stated that his understanding was that my request to remove this item from the consent agenda was no longer, quote, a live request, which was not correct. And I don't know how he got that impression, because in our email exchange, I made pretty clear that Chris Lumber's emailed response only underscored my concern that the wording of the letter of agreement the council was being asked to approve was inconsistent with the intent of the city council and, in fact, with the letter. During the discussion of the issue, I made opening comments, reiterating my concerns about the wording of the letter that was actually before the council as being quite different from the city's intent and from the wording that Chris Lumbra's email stated was in the original proposal, which neither the public nor the city council had seen. Following my statement, the city manager and Chris assured the council that staff and vendor were clear about the intent in the original backroom proposal although Bill indicated that somewhere the building was misnumbered. Uh, others made important comments, including the mayor who asked Chris to verify that dual use with REC was in fact the intent. And Carrie Brown, who stated that she appreciated the, that clarification, quote, so the public can really understand that intent. Again, I couldn't hear whatever Lauren said. Donna then made a motion to approve the letter. Jack checked that she meant the letter as written, which she did. Carrie second, and Jack asked if there was any further discussion. Once again, he apparently wasn't seeing my virtual hand or me waving my hands. As a result, the city council approved the letter of intent that was inconsistent with the city's intent and using language that, in my opinion, is insensitive to underrepresented people. Had I been given the opportunity to comment on this motion. Peter, uh, Peter, your time has elapsed. I, I, your, your point regarding uh, not seeing people uh, asking to be recognized is well taken and i will uh, <clears throat> i'll try to do a better job myself and i'll ask uh, members of the council and staff to again alert me if they see someone that uh, i'm not uh, recognizing and i apologize for not recognizing you um, at our last meeting uh, is there anyone else in the uh, online who would like to be uh, like to address the council I don't see any other hands out up. Anybody in the room who'd like to address the council? Step right up, sir. Good evening. Um, my yeah. name is Clarence Wheeler. I'm the president of the United Motorcyclists of Vermont. Could you step, get closer to the... Okay. Uh, I'm the president of the United Motorcyclists of Vermont, and I believe you have on the agenda our street closure. We do. We found out this evening that um, another organization has the state house lawn for that day, so we're not going to need the the street closure for that day. Uh, so are you going to reschedule it? Um, we, we don't think so. We'll just find another place to end the parade instead of at the state house lawn because uh, we usually do it the second weekend of August, and I dropped the ball. I. For some reason, I just thought about the street closure. I forgot that we had to secure mm -hmm. the state house lawn. Also, oh, it was my sorry mistake. to hear that. So uh, a lot of people rec look forward to that yeah, event every they, year. They do, we do have the weekend before, or the weekend after, but um, mm -hmm. there's going to be a fair on the 12th. So, Donna, have you considered using the high school? That, I mean, you could go still down to Maine and State, and then over to the high school right. for your file. But, and w or we could also just stay on Route 2. Also, they have they have finished there before at, at the high school, and okay. members have already mentioned that on our chat. My wife works at a school, and she said a lot has changed since the last time that, that we've used the high school. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is on a Saturday. It's not really like dirty. Yeah. Well, school. we would like to work with you. So if there's something, if there's some way that you can find a way to have this rescheduled uh, and you need to submit a request for another week no we're not going to change the date okay i'm just wondering you know with the fair being there do we want the street close you know there might be so much traffic already and we're trying to bring you know four or five hundred motorcycles yep. down the down the middle of it when someone already has you know we might still use the you know, high school, but we'd probably stay on Route Two, and then just take just the right. In there. I'm not uh -huh. sure what rivers. Not sure what street that is, but Bailey Avenue. Bailey Avenue, but well, yeah, we'll we'll reach out to the high school and see if we could finish there. But 
I think the yeah. message is we're happy to have you at Montpelier, and if we yeah, can work next it out. year I'm gonna, you know, I have a I have a step by step list now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and there's two. <coughs> I, I just thought there was one form I had to do, but I have to do two <laughs> online. So. Okay. Thank thanks. For thanks time. for letting us know, Donna. But your request to me brings up something that maybe we need to check because our police and fire looked over your application and they okayed it. So it didn't seem like they felt there was any conflict, right. or maybe they didn't know about the state house line. Right. We wouldn't. We would only. We would assume that you know we don't have any issue. We don't have any necessarily contact. So so it's okay with us to close the street and have them ride down the street. We we've got that right. covered. The issue, so, so they've got to yeah. figure out what they do once they get there. And if the state house, so they're, they're not saying there's a conflict so with not, the street. You know, it's they, the well issue. We were is thinking there might be a conflict as far as you know, a fair going I mean, on. I want to see him on, on Main State. I don't want to see him on Route Two. <laughs> okay, I mean, we can't see you over there. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would talk to the police department and see if there's really any conflict about it. Yeah, well, uh, I Chief, 36. do you have any thoughts about that being a conflict along with if there's an event happening on the State House lawn? If you'd like. Yeah. Nothing like putting you on the spot. Yeah, that's okay. That's why I'm here. <laughs> I don't have any problem like with the conflict at all. I, and oftentimes, BGS can split the State House lawn. I just don't know how many people they have for that day or what that event is. But it's worth it looking to see if they could do half and half, which your, your group isn't a, like a protester group that might have a conflict with somebody right. else, so that <laughs> makes it pretty easy to share. So. Right. It's, uh, all, all brains belong, second annual hmm. brain conference. There you go. <laughs> 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 so, you know, I might go to so that, Eric, maybe next here. year yeah. I'll get both. Stay here. <laughs> so so, <laughs> so, so my, so. my question would be, would it would seem like we could go ahead and approve it, and then you could sort out if there's a conflict, you can cancel. But meanwhile, if we approve it, then you right. can do it if you right. get it all arranged. Yeah. We could even contact these okay. folks and yeah. see what, see what okay. they think, uh -huh. if it would be a problem. And then right. Yeah, we don't have to take it off tonight. Well, we can approve it tonight and see what yeah. happens. Then let's yeah. work with if you don't use it, you don't use it. Maybe we can work out together. Okay. Give him my card so uh, he can communicate with me and I can come work through BGS. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank you, sir. Put it in your calendar. All I right, know. Those and are deadly. and I see uh, Carrie Brown Thanks. and Sal, Sal Alfano with their hands up. Hi. Yeah. Um, I appreciate the the sensitivity to the idea of not wanting to drive 500 motorcycles past someone else's event. So if they could talk to the other folks and see if they're okay with it, that's great. Um, but I I imagine they might not be. Um, it's pretty. It's they really take over the motorcycles. And um, so I just want to, I don't want anyone to think that the city council is saying, we think it's fine for them to share the space. I'm okay with approving the street closure in case they are okay with sharing the space. I just don't want that to be the message that comes from city council. Cause I think it's very likely that they, the people on the state house lawn will probably not appreciate the motorcycles going by and that, that should be okay. And it sounds like these other folks have a great plan B in place. So that's what I. Good point, Carrie. Uh, Sal. Yeah, yeah, basically I want, I wanted to urge uh, this, the same, uh, the same concern that Carrie had. Um, if, if the, the other group is all, all brains belong, is that, Yeah. is that what I understand? I, I think certain members of that population would have a lot of trouble with, 500 motorcycles going down the middle of the street. And so uh, I would hope that we would um, consult with leadership at All Brains Belong and see if, um, you know, see if, if they think it can work. But other, otherwise, I would uh, look for an alternative. Okay. There you have anyone else? Okay, there we have it. Uh, <clears throat> Thanks for coming in, and we'll see what, we, what can be done. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. We're still on general business and appearances, and is there anyone else in the room who would like to be heard? Okay. <clears throat> on to the next item, which is the consent agenda. Is the someone want to make a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make the motion. 
and that we approve the consent agenda. Yeah. Is there any discussion? Uh, Sal. I guess I'm uncomfortable with approving uh, the motorcycle closure, frankly, uh, without you know, without a discussion from uh, between all brains belong and, and the motorcycle group. Um, I mean, things like that get lost in, in the shuffle sometimes. So I just as soon pull it out. There's plenty of time, right? Th this event is August, August 12th. So we could, we could put it on a uh, future agenda. I see Donna sh shaking her head. That, that, that's my opinion. Donna. Sorry for the physical movement there, Sal. I feel they need to plan, and I would like to approve it. The State House often has events going on, and they're willing to talk to the other group, but they are independent. They're going by. They're not going to be staying at the State House. That's part of their arrangement is to look to see if they can use the high school or another space. So I'd like to see us approve it and that they're going to be working with our chief of police and negotiate with the group. I'd like them to move ahead. Okay, uh, Sal. I would just reiterate that it's the going by that I think All Brands for Long is going to be concerned about, not so much sharing the State House lawn. So I would like to remove it, the item from the consent agenda for a future meeting. So are you moving to amend Donna's motion to uh, take out that item? I am. Is there a second? Second. Well, I was going to say, Mr. Mayor, it's interesting um, because typically any one, any one council can remove a consent yeah. agenda. He just happened to raise it after the motion had been made. So I don't know if you want to make a mayoral ruling on this <coughs> or not. Uh, yeah, I, I am. There's two motions that have been made and seconded by you. Right. <laughs> exactly. You know, overriding overriding uh, the existence of two normal, in yeah. this questionable way. Yeah. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Right, I know, but our protocol is any one councilman can remove. I'm just talking Robert's rules. I know. Nope, that's true. I, but no, that's true. This time we do it differently. Okay. Yeah, is there? A, I, I think that given that there's been a motion moved and seconded, and a motion moved and seconded, I think we should adhere yeah. to procedure and do that. So, uh, is there any more discussion on uh, on Sal's motion to remove? Uh, this one item, Tim. Uh, just a question, Jack. If what is it possible to take it off the consent agenda, move it to the main agenda? That's what he's proposed. That That's is the amendment that he's proposed. And then can we discuss it and possibly approve it on that with the conditions that people are seeking? Yes. We we could. Yeah. Okay. Any other um, comments by council? And. Lauren, I don't see you. You're not trying to uh, to be heard, are you? Okay. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the motion to remove the toy run from the consent agenda, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. It's unanimous. So that comes off the consent agenda. So now uh, we're on to the main motion, which is to approve the consent agenda. Um, Elaine Ball, I see that you're here, and you propose the uh, the Pride Month resolution. Would you would you like to say a few words before we uh, vote? Yes, thank you. Um, I I appreciate so much the um, adding us to the agenda for flying flags at City Hall and the uh, Montpelier Senior Activity Center as well as the resolution. Um, and the one question that I had, I don't know if it would be appropriate to add to this agenda or just um, arrange at a later date, but um, the Montpelier Community, the Montpelier Senior Activity Center is going to sort of have a lunch time event on June 1st. It's a Thursday at 1130 as like a flag raising um, event and i was wondering if the if the mayor or anyone from the city council would be available to do something like that um earlier in the day or later in the day or sometime in that first week of june 
where the proclamation is read and people can come together to see the flag raised or recognize um, Pride Month in front of City Hall. Well, that sounds great. Why don't we communicate uh, offline about uh, making that happen? Okay, everybody ready to vote on the consent agenda now with the one item removed? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Okay, we've adopted the consent agenda. Now, we are on to the uh, <coughs> to the toy run item on the agenda. Um, Sal, do you want to start this off? Or do you <coughs> sure. Um, well, I I, th I think that the um, I, I think we ought to get the we ought to get the approval of it ought to require the approval of uh, all brands belong. Mm -hmm. um, since I think a mixed a mixed event could could create a problem for one or the other, and it's it's really not so much the gathering at the state house, but it's the um, the the loud um, you know procession down the down the middle of the street that I think might create the problem. Mm -hmm. I don't know; they may be okay with it, but I think we ought to get their approval before we um, as a, as a condition of, of, of approving the application. And, and Carrie? Yeah, so this all started because the organizer of the toy run said that they were withdrawing this request to close the street. And so I'm a little unclear where, where they are. Um, and, and, I'm, and it's a little odd, I think, for someone to request that they, you know, we don't want the street closed and city council to say, yeah, we're closing it anyway. Um, so I would be more comfortable with just taking this off, not doing anything with it, and if they uh, have a conversation with All Brains Belong and decide that it works for them, they can come back. I think there's plenty of time to plan between now and August if they come back in two weeks with a request to close the street. So I think that would be cleaner and it would it would allow it would keep us out of the middle of trying to say we think what, of what should happen with these different groups and just leave it up to them. And then if they work it out and they want to come back to us and make the request again, then I'd be happy to approve it at that point. Donna. A couple of items. One is the state house does their thing in scheduling and we do ours. And we've never looked before at their schedule. The only reason we knew there was a conflict is the motorcycle group came to us tonight. Now, maybe it wasn't heard on the remote, but they actually had a discussion here with the chief of police in saying that they were going to talk to the group, they were going to work with the chief of police, but that they wanted, and they're moving ahead. They left. They thought it was settled, for better or worse. So I feel that, that we, I'm going to vote that we go ahead and allow them to close the street and that under good faith that what they said their intention was to work with our chief of police, to work with that group, and to act accordingly. So, and they're willing to modify and not be staying on State Street to find another place to end. So I like to sort of keep the State House and us with our responsibilities a little separate. But I also think with this group, again, we wouldn't know about it if they hadn't come to us. So I'd, I'd like to respect that their efforts to be polite and that they offered to work with the group and respect that and approve the permit. Okay, um, Bill, maybe you can shed some light on this. This is, and, and let me tell you the question I have. It, it seems weird. In the time I've been on the council, I, I don't ever remember having you know, conditioning or considering uh, a street closing permit on whether the uh, one possible user of the street would be. Um, causing discomfort or inconvenience to someone else who's going to be in the vicinity. And so, uh, you know, it, it's always been in terms of, like, public safety and, and that kind of issue. I think that's correct, Mr. Mayor. I do know, on the other hand, we certainly have heard um, from people we, we've, we have created conditions for various events and closures about noise and those kinds of things when other people have expressed concerns. Um, and, and typically, 
I, I also can't recall an event where somebody had planned a street closure with the assumption that they were using the state house lawn and then had it not available. Basically, mm -hmm. had been pre-booked, and you know, without getting too far down this th this thing, I think um, to Councilmember Alfano's point, it's um, it's also the particular group that's that's using it. It's it's a group of folks that are you know not necessarily neurotypical and for whom loud noises might be more triggering than the average person. And I think the idea is just to be considerate and make sure. So you know, I, adding a condition that everyone's okay with that so that we're not unintentionally inflicting trauma on somebody and it sounded like the motorcycle group was pretty respectful about that anyway so I think you could handle it however you want but I, I do think it's a legitimate issue as much as we love supporting the, the motorcycle group there is a legitimate issue here anybody else on the council have any comments I guess we don't have a motion yet so so I guess the first Donna I'll make that motion I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the permit with the condition that as they promised they are going to be talking with our chief of police and they are going to be talking with the group that's there and if there is a conflict perhaps we can give them a different route so they can still march but maybe not way over in route two but yet miss the state house lawn is there a second okay it's motion and second. Is there any further discussion? Um, Sal. So can we actually put this on the um, application? There's a, there's a space for other. I mean, it's reviewed by, you know, Montpelier Alive and police and fire. There's an other section at the end. We can add this stipulation as a part of the review. I take it. Yeah. Okay. I think we should... We should do that. Okay. I'm okay with that. Any other discussion by uh, from in the council? Any comments from members of the public? Okay. You you all know what the motion is. Is there uh, ready for a vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. Okay. Aye. We'll uh, we'll have to have a roll call. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Then, um, Bate. Yes. Brown. No. Alfano. Yes. Heaney. Yes. Hurl. Cone. Sorry, Cone. Yes. And Hurl. Yes. Okay. So the motion is passed. Thank you. All right, next we have a series of uh, appointments to various Montpelier boards and we can just take them all up and see if there's anyone here who wants to uh, address. We have the Development Review Board, the Energy Advisory Committee, the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, and the Homelessness Task Force. Um, and is anyone in attendance in person who is seeking any of those appointments? Not anyone I've seen. Is there anyone online who is uh, seeking one of those appointments? If so, please uh, raise your hand. Ah, Paige. Paige Gurton. I'm applying for the Homelessness Task Force. <coughs> OK. And is any, do you want to say anything more than that? Does anyone on the council have any questions for Paige? Anybody have any questions? Uh, Sal. I don't have any questions. I have my, I want to give my full support to Paige, who has done a lot of good work on the, uh, on the task force, um, particularly in these last few hectic weeks. Thank you for that, Paige. Thank I you. I totally agree. Um, <laughs> any is there any other person who's applied for any of the other positions? Okay, how do you want to proceed? Does someone want to make a motion to, we can do it item by item, but some could also move to appoint all the uh, applicants at once. Gary. 
Yeah, I move that we appoint all of the named applicants to the Development Review Board, the Energy Advisory Committee, Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, and the Homelessness Task Force. And is there a second? I'll second. Donna, okay. Any any further any discussion? Just Tim. thanking everyone for participating and, and helping make all these different initiatives work. Thank you. I totally agree. You know, we we have we go back and back and back to members of the community and we consistently get really committed and high quality highly qualified applicants for these uh, seats. With that, uh, all those in favor indicate by oh indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Next up we have Casella and uh, leachate treatment. Great. Thank you very much. My name is Sam Nikolai. I'm Vice President of Engineering with Casella Waste. With me today is Jeremy Labby, who is our uh, General Manager at our Coventry Landfill. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to come before the Council today. Uh, we have a short presentation. We'll, we'll try to keep it relatively brief, but um, certainly would encourage any questions that, that folks may have. Um, we can, can I interrupt for a second? We do not have the shared screen on the Zoom. Thanks, Carrie. You're still working on that, apparently. Sam Nikolai and Jeremy Labby. So we're here today primarily to give an update to the council on uh, PFAS treatment, uh, at least from the landfill. So just stepping uh, briefly backward, if I'm hoping that most people are familiar with PFAS, they are a class of compounds that starting in the 1940s, we as a society have used in a variety of commercial industrial uses. They're probably most famous in terms of Teflon or carpet stain protection, furniture stain protection, but the reality is they were compounds that were used in almost every aspect of our industrial society for the last 50 uh, plus years. So on the screen there, you can see um, some references, everything from microwave popcorn bags to firefighting foam to makeup, various food packaging. Uh, we as a society have managed to use these compounds in almost everything over the last uh, several decades. So all these uh, compounds then are thrown away as people work through the various materials in their lives. And um, both from a wastewater and a landfill standpoint, uh, PFAS ends up coming down to, to the end of the line. And so the landfill receives various waste materials from homeowners, from residents, from commercial businesses that contain PFAS. Uh, several years ago, we did an evaluation to understand what kind of PFAS was present at the landfill. That chart you see on the screen, the bar on the left is measuring the PFAS that came into the landfill, and the brown box on the right is measuring the PFAS that came out of the landfill. So landfill does a great job of keeping most of the PFAS in the landfill, but most is not all. And so there's a small amount that comes out, and it comes out in the leachate. You can see on the right there, the sources of the PFAS, they're primarily furniture, textiles, and carpeting, kinds of materials that all of us have in our households and that we're all throwing away on a weekly and monthly annual basis. So we've been working hard in concert with the DC and at the request of city council to do something about the PFAS. City council asked us um, to attempt to remove PFAS from the leachate and had a desire to do so, and you requested that to be done by July of this year. There is no state regulatory requirement for PFAS yet in surface water, so we don't have a regulatory requirement today, but both Casella and I think the City Council share the goal of removing PFAS. 
So we're here today to give you an update on that. We have been looking at a technology called foam fractionation, which didn't really exist at the time that we evaluated technologies back in 2018, 2019. It certainly wasn't applicable to landfill leachate. But over the last few years, it has been technology that has been advanced and shown a lot of promise. Essentially, PFAS likes to bubble. And if you bubble leachate over and over again, you can force the PFAS to come up into the foam. And if you bubble the foam, you can concentrate the foam and get the PFAS to stay in the foam and out of the leachate. Very simple concept. Uh, and there are a number of different technology systems that use it, but it appears to be quite effective at doing what we want, which is removing PFAS from leachate and getting it into a very small quantity of foam that we can manage in a better way. So here's the status of our permitting. We have a pretreatment permit that was issued in December of last year. That's the permit that allows leachate to come from the landfill to the city's wastewater plant. In that permit, there's a requirement to do a pilot study evaluating technology. We've submitted that pilot study earlier this year, and it is currently in front of the Agency of Natural Resources for review. The second permit that we needed was to modify the landfills permit to allow us to do that technology on the landfill site. We received that permit in March of this year. The third and final permit that we need is the Act 250 land use modification. That has been pending for several months we now have a draft, and we expect that, that final permit to be issued in the next month or two. Ultimately, that's up to Act 250's timeline, um, but we think we're very close, and we'll see that within the next 60 days or so. Here's the results of the testing that we've done so far. This is on our actual leachate. It's not theoretical. This is our real leachate being treated. Those five compounds are the compounds that are regulated in Vermont for PFAS. Compounds number three and four, we get excellent removal. We're calling that 100% removal. We'll talk a bit about what 100% means. Compounds one and two, a little bit tougher, but with the proper system and tweaking, we get very high 90s to 100%. The fifth compound is the stubborn one. We've not quite gotten all the way to 100, but we get the vast majority of it removed, 85 to 95%. So when we say 100% removal, there is no zero in terms of analytical testing. There's only what we can see. And so these levels are at the parts per trillion level, really, really tiny amounts. So we're getting 100% removal down to the, the laboratory's ability to see the amounts. I hope that's clear for folks. There is no zero. There's only getting really, really, really small. Yes. Leachate that's being tested, or is this after the new treatment program? These are the results of treating the current leachate, and that's how much is remaining. So that's the current. Yep. Okay. Thanks. A little bit more on the laboratory reporting. Again, we're doing very, very, very small, small concentrations, concentrations here. here. The drinking water levels are about the level of 20 PPT parts per trillion, very, very small. The reporting limits for the labs are range from a high of 50, the detection limits getting down to 10 to 20. So our ability to see is about the same level as what is required in drinking water. So I'm mixing here, right? Nobody drinks wastewater. So the drinking water levels don't apply to wastewater. But that's, that's what we're, what trying, we're trying to get, get to. to. We're trying to get, get cleanup consistent with drinking water. At the end of the day, um, these bars represent the amount of PFAS that is in the plant at uh, here in Montpelier. And, and what are the units? These are mass, so these are grams per day. So a gram is a measure of weight about equal to a paper clip. So very, very small amounts. The blue represents the amount of PFAS that's coming in to the wastewater plant from sources in Montpelier and Berlin. PFAS is in everything. It's coming in from residential. It's coming in from commercial. It's coming in from industrial. This is not solely a landfill leachate issue. The green represents the PFAS that's coming to Montpelier from leachate. So the leachate represents about a third 
of the total PFAS loading coming into the plant. That makes sense to everybody. Mm -hmm. PFAS in leachate is highly concentrated, but the volume of leachate is much, much smaller than the overall amount of wastewater. So on the left, you have the pretreatment. On the right, you have post-treatment. We were able to get our green bar down to that very low level where you can barely see it. You still have the blue because it's coming from the sources that are within the city. But hopefully we would all recognize that this would be an extraordinary accomplishment and an improvement over the current situation. These graphs basically show the same thing a little bit differently. You're seeing the, the existing grams on the left, the treatment, and then the post-treatment grams on the right, and the pie chart sort of show that distribution again between the landfill leachate side and the green and the city uh, represent, representation in the blue. So that was a lot to get to this slide. <laughs> Where are we? We expect our Act 250 approval within the next two months. We're calling that second quarter of this year. We are set up to start construction of our treatment building in the third quarter of this year. Contractor already selected, steel already on its way. The minute we get our Act 250 permit, we'll be ready to move forward. We expect to start installation of our equipment this year and to have it complete by the fourth quarter of this year. As always, we're dependent on things like availability of materials, scheduled to get it all done, but we feel good about it. We've done everything we can to make sure that we're in the right place and installing this timely. We'll go into formal pilot testing in the start of next year, 2024. That's what's required in our permit. And we'll be doing pilot test reporting and permit modifications all the way into 2025. But I don't want to distract from the real goal, which is get PFAS out of leachate as quickly as we can. And when are we going to be doing that? As soon as the equipment is in. We'll go through pilot testing in order to modify our permits, in order for the state to come up with the appropriate levels, in order for us to have the right permit conditions. But the minute the system is in, we're going to be pulling PFAS out of leachate. So today, our request is to give you this update. City Council has tasked us with getting PFAS out of leachate by July of this year. We're not quite going to make it. We're very close. We need one more permit. We need to construct the building. And we need to install our equipment. So our request today is for city council to extend us until the end of the year, from July until December. We will continue to bring the limited amount of leachate that we do, which is approximately one load a day. And the minute the equipment is installed, we'll be removing PFAS from leachate, which I think is the ultimate goal for both us and the city. I'll certainly stop there and see if there are any questions. And is that the end of the report? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. This is, I think it's pretty impressive. Um, do people in the council have any questions? Start with people in the room because I can see you. I appreciate the charts and the graphs and all the explanation. It's very helpful. Go ahead, Tim. Um, I, I appreciate it as well. I, it's also one of these issues. It's the first time we've discussed it since I've been on the council. I'm new here, so I apologize that I don't have the history. It, and it is an issue that as a citizen, before I was elected, I followed in the news. And the, I still, it's like, why are we accepting this here? <laughs> no other um, wastewater treatment plant in, in the state is accepting this, 8,100 gallons a day. Um, it's bad stuff. I mean, it's it's so bad they closed the high school in Burlington because the window putty broke out and contaminated the soils. Um, you know, it's something that we all generate. So I re acknowledge the responsibility that not just Montpelier, but everyone has. Um, so I, I'm still struggling with even an extension of it. If there's any other way to contain it till there's a way to treat it. You know, it's going into the river. It flows north. It flows to Lake Champlain. That is a water source for thousands and thousands of people in Vermont. Um, whatever little money we're getting for treating it at our plant is nothing compared to what it will cost to mitigate down the road. I, I, if nothing I'll end with, if we're having trouble getting permitting from the state, 
this is an oh my god moment. Somebody's got to call the governor, and we've got to work on an Act 250 expedited process for this. Waiting months for treatment of this is it's just not okay. To be clear, the the putty issue are, are PCBs, oh, um, which are different than PFAS, uh, but it's certainly a fair point of, of yeah. things that have to be controlled and regulated. If PFAS is tough, it, it's a compound that a set of compounds that we society have been using, and we're faced with the fact that every wastewater plant in the United States has PFAS in it, mm -hmm. whether it's coming from a rural, urban, or suburban area, it's present there. So it's not a, a land for leachate problem it's a it's an industry problem so we appreciate that the city has been a, a longtime partner of ours in terms of, of waste management we've recognized that this is a problem that needs to be solved that we have to come up with a solution we're asking you guys to continue to be our partner with that and come up with that solution for the state of vermont the the leachate um, being successfully treated is a critical component of protecting water quality and montpelier has been a key part of that solution you know, both for us and for the state of Vermont. So I totally understand your concern, right? That these are compounds that we need to deal with. Um, but, you know, I'm happy to say both from our perspective and from your perspective, we're ahead of what the state's asking us to do. We're ahead of what most states are asking folks to do. Um, we're about 90% of the way there. We're looking for this last period to, to kind of bring it home and install the treatment and move, be able to move forward. Donna. I just want to respond a little bit to Tim. Uh, I felt it was worth getting the investment of a pilot project because if they don't take it to us, they're going to take it to New York, and it ends up in the same place in the, as far as the lake water. And I don't feel they're going to be as responsible in, in, of dealing with it as we are. That we're already doing a better job. And so I see it as a – I was hoping July. I mean, I guess I could look at six months – because I, I want us to be an example that this is stuff that we're responsible for and that we need to deal with and not just pass it the buck. Okay, it goes to New York. It's above us in Montpelier. Um, I, I just feel we should be part of the, of the solution. That's all. Uh, before we get into debate, uh, Carrie, uh, I see you've got your hand up. Yes, I am in, in a similar situation as Tim of not having been part of this um, decision uh, um, in the past. And so I don't know exactly what went into the, the naming of the date of July 1st as a deadline, but I, I assume that it was well thought out and had a good rationale for it. And so um, if we're going to override that, if we're going to extend that, then... Um, I need to really understand what it is that we're weighing exactly. So we have some revenue that comes from doing this, um, but it. But I agree with Tim that it's nothing compared to what the cost might be to any kind of damage inflicted by this. So that doesn't feel very motivating to me. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear Donna's take on us being partners and us being a model or a way to handle this. Um, so I guess my question it, to to our presenters is um, if we were to to say no, we need to stick with the original deadline, um, but that we would be willing to take the leachate when again once it has no PFAS in it, um, is that is that a, a workable solution for them? Do they have somewhere else to take it in the meantime? So the answer is yes. There is a potential solution, Montpelier takes a portion of leachate today and a portion goes to Plattsburgh, New York. It's obviously not um, our desire to do that. We, we think working with the city as partner um, helps us in order to um, establish the right treatment because the goals that we're establishing here are in concert with the city and how we treat the leachate and the levels we get to it affect our, our permit with the city. But the answer to your question is, it, it is possible for us to take a pause. We would prefer not to. We would prefer simply to allow the deadline to be moved six months. We feel we're not asking an unreasonable amount of time. We're not asking to say, oh, you know, we'll come back in four months or 36 months, um, but that we're most of the way there and that 
keeping this momentum and keeping the concert with the city and, and Casella together. But to be fair, to answer your question, yes, we have an alternative, which is to take it to New York. Um, any other questions, Sal? And we will get to members of the public, but uh, getting questions. Yeah, from the I guess I, I just have two, have two quick questions. One is, um, uh, is it possible to store the the leachate for six months until or or less, depending on when when the the uh, active fifty permit comes through? And the other question is, what do you do with the the foam fact, fractionate that that's in, you know uh, encapsulated the uh, the PFAS? What, what what do you do with that at, when the process is complete? Two good questions. Uh, so the first one, uh, no, it is not possible to store. Um, so we average about 30,000 gallons a day of, of leachate. We have enough storage on site um, to help manage that, but the storage is, is measured in weeks, um, not months. Uh, so you know, while we have storage to help manage the ups and downs, we cannot store leachate for any, any particular length of time. It has to be treated and moved. Um, second question is uh, a tinker. The short term plan for the foam is to mix it with Portland cement and make a block. And that block will be dropped into the landfill. Um, the, the testing will show that the PFAS is bound up into the concrete and that the block will sit in the landfill, do no damage, do no harm, it'll be locked up. The landfill does a great job of locking up PFAS that's in the loose in the materials. It'll do even a better job um, locking it up in concrete. The longer term plan is we want to destroy it. The destruction technologies are a little bit behind the separation technologies as an industry. So we don't quite yet have commercial scale technologies to actually destroy the compounds. But we think that they're probably in the two to three year kind of time frame. A lot of smart minds working on this right now. And we think in about that time frame, there'll be enough technology where you'll take the foam, you'll put it essentially in a treatment system, and you'll actually destroy the compounds. And that'll be the ultimate goal. Oh boy, this I, I've got questions too. This this kind of reminds me of the uh, waste from nuclear waste <laughs> question, um, and we're dealing. You know that we still haven't solved that problem, and we've been generating it for uh, for many decades now. Um, I'm glad you answered Sal's questions about what happens to, to the leachate or, or what happens to the uh, to the uh, PFAS molecules that are removed. Um, part uh, one of my questions is, I s are are you worried that uh, for one thing, there's no federal standards yet, right? And those are being developed now? There are draft federal drinking water standards. And are they more stringent than what you're testing to, less stringent than what you're shooting to? That's a complicated answer. The, the federal standards are slightly different than the state standards. They aren't the same set of compounds and the numbers are slightly different, but they are uh, reasonably similar. Mm -hmm. They are drinking water standards, not wastewater standards. So the wastewater standards are still to come. In this state and in this country, we don't regulate wastewater the same way we do drinking water. So there will be different levels for wastewater than there are drinking water. But being ahead of the game, we're driving toward drinking water standards. And in um, and this gets me to the other question about well, are you scared because it seems like more of these compounds are being uh, discovered, and do we know that whatever new compounds are discovered are going to be uh, amenable to the same kind of uh, treatment that uh, that you're doing putting in place now? And then the second part of this, which is uh, I would guess would be a concern is that what your standards are keyed to is what's detectable. And 
the way technology goes, we know that more and more uh, testing uh, equipment will be able to detect more at a at a finer level than is detectable now. So how do you deal with that when that happens, when it's uh, when you're not looking at parts per trillion, but parts per quadrillion or quintillion? There's no question that as a society, we are going to continue to um, understand better the compounds that are present in all of our wastewater. And there's no question that we will be able to see to lower and lower limits. That has been the trend for as long as we've been monitoring in the last 50 years. We Pretty much any, any, any pollutant, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. w we feel strongly, and I think others do as well, that uh, we have to draw the line in the sand somewhere, and here's where we're drawing the line and saying these are the compounds that we know about. We're going to get them out. And in three years, if there's another compound that is identified, whether it's in wastewater or in leachate, then we're going to have to develop to get that out too. Uh, but, but we have to draw the line somewhere and start coming up with a solution. And our goal is to, to remove as much mass as we possibly get. We're going to get the compounds out that are regulated by Vermont, and we're going to get the compounds out that are regulated by EPA. And if we get better science and says that we've got to chase other compounds, then we've got to chase those compounds. But today, this is the best information we have, and we think it's prudent to get this mass out as quickly as we can so that we feel good about us managing our waste and us managing our wastewater. Again, it's not a landfill leachate issue. It's a, it's a society issue. It's in the wastewater with or without the leachate. We're trying to come up with a solution for the landfill leachate, which makes that as small a contribution as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, Sal? Two, two questions. My, my questions come in Paris tonight. Um, in the foam fractionate, fractionation process, are there any other contaminants created? And if so, what do you do with them? And when, when you, uh, if we extend this and you're successful and um, you can, you have you have established this process. Is it scalable so that it it would become available to say the Montpelier waste treatment plant, uh, or, so or or does the leachate? Would we be trucking our leachate to you to remove the PFAS? Good questions. Uh, so first question: uh, the foam fractionation does a pretty good job of targeting the PFAS and the PFAS only. Uh, so that we see the PFAS r reduced by the percentages, but almost everything else stays pretty close, which is why we need to continue the partnership with the city, because we need the city's wastewater treatment to reduce the rest of the compounds that are in the landfill leachate. So we're, we're simply pre-treating, knocking the PFAS down, and then continuing to do what we've done for decades, which is allow the city's wastewater plant to remove the, the rest of the, the compounds. Um, there's no evidence of any other compounds increasing or new things forming. The, the foam process is a fairly straightforward process. You're, you're just bubbling, and PFAS likes the bubbles. <laughs> um, second question, you know, this is a, a big question for society. Are wastewater plants going to have to treat for PFAS regardless of the industries and whether or not landfills are involved? And I wish I knew the answer to that, and I don't. Um, you know, society is going to struggle with that over the next so many years because it's a big problem for wastewater plants. The answer to your question is, if you did, you would use a different technology. You're not going to use foam fractionation on, waste, on municipal wastewater. You're going to have to use a different set of technology because the compounds are at different levels and you have different other compounds in wastewater than you do in landfill leachate. So you would not use foam fractionation. You would never bring wastewater from the city to the landfill or, or anything of that nature. This would be landfill specific. And Tim. Do those other technologies exist? They do. Um, PFAS um, responds well to things like carbon treatment. Th that works well. So if you have a, cl a fairly clean 
stream of water with the process in it, you can get it out. Whether you're going to do that at the end of your wastewater plant or try to get it at the beginning are some difficult questions to answer. Um, are, are there any other, before we get to discussion, are there any other questions from members of the council? I see one member of the public has had her hand up for extended period. I just wanted to offer a piece of information to respond to. I think the question that uh, Council Member Brown asked about the, the rationale. So when, when the council met with Casella a couple years ago and we talked about this problem and they described the process ahead, uh, it was their estimation that they could complete this process around now. Um, and so that, that's why this date was selected, uh, knowing that there was, um, you know, permitting issues. So uh, the council chose to pick a hard date. There was even some talk about should it be longer, should it be uh, softer. And I think the council felt very strong that if we set a hard deadline, that will spur action. And what I think, and again, I don't want to speak for prior council members. I'll let them speak. It was my understanding that they said, you know, what we really want to see is evidence that real work is being done to address the issue. And I know the Casella's come back at least once and updated the council on progress to date. And the other thing the council asked for, um, in addition to the date, was that the goal be the drinking water standard, not a wastewater standard, and that is what they're doing. So essentially they asked them to, to, to say, look, treat it to a point where if it were in our, in our drinking water system, it would meet the EPA standards for people to consume. So that was the rationale between the two requests of the council. Obviously, here we are, and it's up to you all to do what you feel like you need to do, but that's, that's how we got to where we're at today. And, and part of my recollection was that we, I don't think anyone was sure that you would be even where you are now on July 1st of 2023, but why not We want, why not put it a pretty aggressive uh, standard on in the hopes that it would spur, spur action. I think, I think it has done that. Um, let's take uh, comments from the public. Paige Curtin, you've had your hand up. I just have um, a, a quick question. It kind of speaks to the societal aspect of this problem. Um, when you you showed the very first slide, I think it was, that had a lot of food packaging on it, are those sources of PFAS? They are, and um, right now mostly were. Uh, Vermont now has a law in place that bans the use of PFAS in food packaging. It's one of the very few states that does. Um, so we are dramatically improving as a society, but, but yes, um, up, to up to essentially recently, that has been true. Okay. But I, but I would imagine if you buy a hamburger that, has, uh, that comes in a paper that's wrapped in PFAS, some of the in or that has PFAS on it, some of that probably rubs off on the food and, and you're eating it. There's so an estimate that 98% that, that of adults in the United States have detectable levels of PFAS in your blood because we've been using these compounds and eating these compounds and walking in these compounds for so long. The good news is they're on the decline because we've been forcing them out of our society and stop using them. But we're still going to be dealing with the after effects for, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Donna. One of the charts that was linked to our agenda had the food wrappings, had uh, specific amounts. It wasn't in the, the presentation you gave, but for Paige and others, if they look at the attachment on the agenda, and my question was, some of those, is that, was that the level yesterday, today, a year ago? <laughs> I mean, you said the paper has improved in Vermont, so if we won't let Burger King, like Burger King had one wrapping that was really high. Yeah, it was a consumer reports table. So I would estimate that is a few years old. Okay. Um, but, but again, only some states have banned food packaging containing PFAS. Vermont is one of them, but it is not a universal ban across the U.S. Yeah, Tim. The numbers for, like, foundation for makeup uh, was yeah, way more than Burger King. <laughs> um, it's way more than what's in our it, it just, yeah, the, like, 
Gore-Tex, a lot of things we all know and love. It's just, it's really big. We have PFAS in our blood, not because of landfill leach eight. We yeah. have it because we're sitting on couch cushions and walking on carpets and wearing jackets that contain this stuff, unfortunately. So, council members, what, uh, where are we? What's your pleasure? I'd like just to add, Lauren um, had a weak connection. She knew that she might not. If she's not there, I don't see her. But she did send an email and saying that she didn't want it to be extended too far, but that she was still, I, th I felt her email said she was still uh, open to us working with them. So I I'd like to see us do the six months extension. They've, they're ahead. I mean, we knew the permitting was going to be an issue. It was total guesswork how long the permitting. We did have the state people come in and they talked to us and they had no more clue than <laughs> the rest of us. So I feel it was a, a guess that Casella has really moved forward on and I'd like us to do the six month extension. So that's a motion? That's a motion. Okay. And is there a second? I'll second. All right. Is there any discussion on the motion? Tim. So this is all predicated on an Act 250 permit. So the six months isn't going to happen if you don't have a permit in two? That's correct. So I would amend the motion to say that if we don't have an Act 250 permit in hand in 60 days that we reconvene and consider the extension. I mean, you're talking... <sighs> you just add up the numbers at 8,100 gallons a day in terms of what we're taking at our plant. And that's only a third, roughly, not even a third of the total e that's being produced in Coventry, right? Yeah, the numbers that we presented to you were the maximum. So uh, once upon a time, 30,000 gallons did come to okay. come up here. That's not true today. We're taking far less. Yeah. But when you add it up, I can see why you can't store it. It's, it's just way over a million mm -hmm. gallons th th in a very short time. So I do think if we can do the 60-day review... Uh, so that's so that's a motion, or that, or you're accepting yeah, that I'm as accepting a accepting a sixty day mm -hmm. review, but I'd also like encourage us then to try to put some pressure on Act yeah. Two Hundred and Fifty. That's possible. Yeah. Do you do you know what the status of the Act Two Hundred and Fifty application is, and what to expect? We've seen they've issued a draft, which typically means that they are close. There is uh, a comment period, which closes at the end of the month. End of this month, like next the week. End of May. Okay. Perhaps they can offer formal letter to Act 250 to encourage approval. Uh, if if we're interested as a as a uh, partnership here, you know, to encourage Act 250 to approve things in a timely manner, um, would be greatly appreciated if the council were willing to do so. Okay. Um, Sal. Is there? <coughs> uh, do you know enough about from the draft? of your application, um, what, what the two Act 250 issues are, and, and are you, do you feel like they're resolvable in uh, 60 days? Interestingly, Act 250 doesn't really have jurisdiction over wastewater plants. They don't really care about treatment. What they care about is how the land is being used, and so what they're really approving is the building. <laughs> and so we believe that, yes, um, they will ultimately approve it and and do so without significant conditions because we already have the permits that matter, which are the permits from wastewater and solid waste. Act 250 is a land use, not a mm -hmm. not a treatment technology permit. So the answer is yes, we expect to. It's just a matter of timing. There has been some resistance from the Canadian groups to uh well to coventry itself but but to this particular issue uh do you see uh do you see that uh, as affecting the act 250 permit process there's always the potential um the consistent message that i think the canadian groups have is about not wanting to see a discharge within the watershed which would then go into lake memphis magog and that's not being proposed here. This is one of the, the valuable parts of the partnership is that allowing it to come to Montpelier and be properly treated. 
Having said that, and I stood before this council a year ago and said this, and I'll say it again, all water has to be protected, whether it's Lake Memphis Magog, Lake Champlain, the Connecticut River, the Winooski River, they all need to be protected. And so our goal is to do that. But, um, but certainly the Canadian groups have and, and may continue to, to advocate for their positions primarily uh, about the watershed. Okay. Uh, any other discussion by any or comments by any members of the council? Or are we ready for a vote? Could I just offer a very s minor suggestion? Yep. You said 60 days. I just took a quick look at the calendar. That would maybe instead of saying 60 days, just say to be reviewed at the, the July 26 meeting. Because I don't, I didn't count whether it was 59 days or 61 days or whatever. But but that's right that's, in the that's zone. two months mm -hmm. from now, which would be approximately 60 days. So then it makes you know, just to be clear and yeah. work for everybody. Okay. Are we ready for a vote? If so, all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, anyone opposed? Uh, the motion carries. Um, before we uh, send you off, I'll, uh, what do members of the council think about sending a letter to, uh, to uh, the Act 250 people saying, please get this uh, acted on as quickly as possible because the uh, impact on the environment is uh, is tremendous. Okay, we need. Do we yeah, need? I, I support that. Okay, great. Even a call is they got people they know. <laughs> Our staff have people we know. Okay. I don't think you need to make a motion to gather the record. We'll, we'll send it out on behalf of mayor and council. Probably have. Okay, I can sign it. Sign yep. Like mm -hmm. Have in the past, but we'll say it was as per this meeting. Okay, great. great. Thanks for coming in. I was just up in up there last week at Court in Newport. I should have stopped by. But yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I'll just say one of the I think a couple of us have been here since the beginning, um, and and not to downplay the importance of this issue because it's huge. But the progress you all have made on this is really pretty astounding. Um, I don't. I'm not even sure you thought you'd be here at this time. So, um, and we've appreciated your regular updates. So, thank you. Thank you very much. We, we appreciate the, the council's support. We believe strongly that we've been moving in the right direction. We'll acknowledge that the council has helped move us along <laughs> by setting that deadline and pushing us. But we think it's a good outcome, and we look forward to being back here in July and sharing good news. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Thanks. OK. Next up, we have the, an update on the water resource recovery facility. I assume. Uh, Kurt, you're up. Okay. Good evening. I'm Kurt Modica, Director of Public Works. With me tonight, I've got Colin O'Brien with Brown and Caldwell, Project Manager. For our wastewater project, and Chris. I'm not yep. very oh, sorry. <coughs> Hello. Is that better? No. Uh, also with me tonight is Chris Cox, uh, Chief Operator of the Water Resource Recovery Facility with the City of Montpelier. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about a um, a next project at the wastewater plant. A, a little background for some of the new council members. Um, from 2019 to 2021, we did a large upgrade at the Water Resource Recovery Facility, also known as the Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, that project was uh, an, an organics to energy um, and aging infrastructure improvement project. So it gave us the ability to take in high strength waste, such as um, uh, fats, oils, and grease, and uh, food waste, um, like uh, dairy byproducts. Um, uh, it enhanced our, the, the uh, uh, digestion process, which is um, you know, a process of bugs sort of breaking down this uh, granic material, food waste material, um, and then gave us the ability to create methane uh, that we use for uh, heating buildings in the wintertime. So there's a lot of um, economic benefits to that project. We, we charge for the waste that's trucked into the plant, and then we 
convert that to renewable energy and, and use it to offset operating costs. Um, so this project, uh, so that project was really um, a revenue generation type project uh, as well as um, energy efficiencies. Um, this, this project that we're going to talk about tonight is sort of um, the next uh, step in improving the plant. And um, it is not so much as a revenue generation project as it is a, a future cost avoidance project. Um, so uh, an issue facing um, the state and the nation, we talked a lot about PFAS with the last presentation, um, in the liquid stream, so the, the liquids that run through the plant. But there's also the solid stream, so those get pulled out uh, of the liquid as part of the process of the plant. Um, and, and at the end, you're left with this um, solids material that you have to do something with, and it also has a PFAS in it. And so we're going to talk tonight about um, uh, ways we're looking at managing um, that waste stream, um, some of the future cost implications with managing that. So um, historically, a lot of the solids from plants and from septic tanks, residential septic tanks, have been spread on fields. But with um, the emerging PFAS issues, that's really all going away. So um, really the only alternative uh, without doing um, sort of innovative projects uh, is to bring that material to the landfill, um, which we just heard a lot about the challenges um, that we're dealing with uh, on that front. So um, just that's just kind of the, the high level background where we were and, and where we're heading with this project. Um, and tonight we're going to we're going to be asking to approve the design of this work, but I wanted to give a background of what the project um, really is all about for some of the new council members and just to kind of debrief um, existing uh, their former council members um, to remind them why we're doing this and um, sort of uh, where we're at with um, the project. So some of the uh, discussion topics for tonight, uh, the biosolids uh, drying and ther thermal conditioning um, alternatives that we're looking at, um, some of the project benefits, uh, other aspects of the project uh, outside of biosolids drying, and um, cost estimates and the financial um, funding alternatives. So um, starting with the, with the biosolids, um, as I noted, um, there's the real the options are really getting limited because of the PFAS issue and the biosolids and how to manage it. Um, there is a, a lot of municipalities in Central Vermont have been um, working with a uh, a Canadian company to uh, truck the biosolids to Canada and use it for um, like filling mines and things like that. Uh, that com the can Canada or Quebec, we was taking a lot of this, has said by the end of this year they're no longer going to. Um, accept that in Canada because of the PFAS issue again. Uh, so that means there's going to be even uh, more pressure on, on the landfill and there is a limit there's only one landfill in Vermont and they do have a limited capacity so um, so just to kind of look at some of the alternatives uh, for managing this waste stream uh, th where we started was uh, um, indirect hot water belt dryer so um, that process would use the methane generated from uh, the food waste that we take in under the, the previous project. Um, the, the, some of the uh, pros about it is it's a, a proven technology. It's been around a long time. Um, it has a relatively low uh, maintenance requirements and, and you can run it without staff on site. So uh, our plant only has four operators and um, we only run uh, day one daytime shift. So uh, we do not have um, you know staff to run 24-7 uh, on site. <laughs> Uh, the next alternative that we're looking at is gasification with a with a drum dryer. Um, so th in this case, the um, the fuel source for the dryer is actually uh, created from the burning of the solids. So the gasification component is a very high temperature um, sort of oven, and that and when the um, biosolids once it gets going is combusted, then you can pull heat off of that combustion process and run the dryer. So they run in in tandem. Um, this has a higher level of maintenance um, and you also have to have staffing on site when, whenever it's running. So there's some challenges there. It is also a, a new technology. Um, but this, this technology does have a significant reduction in PFAS levels. 
um, as to opposed to the, the belt dryer, which really does not uh, imp or reduce PFAS levels at all. Um, uh, additionally, for, for all of these options, you have uh, a reduced volume of solids. So as you, as you dry um, the solids, you take the water out, uh, it's, it's lighter and you have a, a less or lower disposal cost. And then the most recent um, technology we've been looking at is paralysis with a bio dryer. Um, again, this, fuel s this uses a fuel source from the solids um, with heat recovery that runs back to the dryer um, to dry the solids. Uh, this is a, a very low maintenance alternative and it does have the ability to run unstaffed. Um, again, very new technology. A lot of, uh, basically any of the technology dealing with the, the PFAS issue is gonna be a newer emerging technology. Um, but this technology also does uh, reduce the PFAS and um, you know, reduce your uh, total um, disposal needs for, for the solid stream. It also has the ability to um, create a renewable product, um, it's, it's called biochar, which has a potential for even a, like a saleable material. So a, a small amount of revenue potential from the end product. Um, so, uh, uh, overview of uh, the project components, a little hard to see here, but um, there are actually three major components uh, to this project. Uh, the, the, the largest one being the biosolids uh, that I just reviewed. Um, there's also um, odor control. So, under the phase one upgrade, um, the food waste, we, we believe, is um, the strongest contributor to odors at the plant. Um, in particular, there's a, what we call a blend tank where the trucked in waste streams are mixed um, before they go to the digesters. And, um, you know, we think that the large uh, component of the odors we're experiencing, or the, the public has been experiencing at the plant, is from uh, that tank. Um, but to do a holistic approach, we're looking at odor treatment for where um, the wit this trucked waste stream is, is discharged, which is called the headworks, um, from the blend tank that I just described. That would be uh, one odor control unit. And then in the um, dewatering building where we first um, sort of squeezed the water out of the solids before it would go to a dryer, um, there would be a second odor control unit. Uh, in that location, um, and then potentially even a third one that's not actually noted on this map is where the ammonia treatment um, is, is being evaluated as potential uh, uh, for a third location. Um, uh, the third uh, primary component of this project is the secondary clarifiers, so the circular tanks on the bottom left. Um, that's the only major piece of infrastructure that was not upgraded in the last project, so, um, and it's really critical to the operations uh, of the plant. So um, that's sort of the third piece. And then um, we can get into the ammonia treatment on a, a little bit more on, an, on a, another slide. Um, so move on from here. Um, just a little overview back to the solids uh, uh, piece. Well, really uh, all the three major components. Um, so the, as I noted, the solids drying or gasification or paralysis, which, whichever option is ultimately selected, uh, allows for a stabilized and reduced solids disposal cost with lower trucking and emissions. So there's um, a financial and, a, and an environmental benefit. Um, and again, there's a, there's a potential for an actually creating a renewable product from something that is currently all, all landfilled. Um, again, the, the um, potential for PFAS reduction in the solid stream. Um, this is separate from the liquid stream that the slides that Casella showed um, but again, it's still an issue that um, needs to be dealt with. Uh, the project would resolve our, we actually have a, a permit violation from the air quality division. So we're under a uh, permit requirement to resolve the odor issue at the plant. Uh, that project would accomplish that. Um, and then as I noted, the, the secondary clarifiers, which are on the bottom right there, would be uh, rehabilitated as part of the project. Um, a little bit on the ammonia treatment that I noted. So uh, as we were working through um, the scope of this final design contract, um, v Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation let us know that we are going to have a uh, ammonia limit on our discharge from the plant. We currently do not have any ammonia limits um, in our permit. 
Um, but, so we thought uh, it would be it makes sense to um, at least uh, start on um, you know some improvements to reduce the ammonia levels at the plant. So we have um, added in the scope um, to sort of take uh, the water that comes out of the solids when they are um, sort of squeezed or dewatered and um, do some preliminary treatment on that um, that waste stream, that liquid stream, um, to help reduce those those ammonia levels. Um, so we'll be uh, adding a, a pump in the dewatering building to bring it over to a tank that would be refurbished in order to do some high level treatment. We don't, we're not gonna do a whole evaluation um, at this point to ensure we're gonna hit all our target limits, but um, we feel confident that with this, um, with this level of treatment and um, some additional, uh, you know, chemical addition options that we we feel we pr we think we can we can hit those levels, and there is quite a bit of time um, for the permit to to um, comply with uh, with what the new limits will be. So um, you know, they said likely they would the state would be asking us to meet those limits in five years, but if but there's a potential for even longer if we if we absolutely need to. Um, and then also I want to talk a little bit about um, energy efficiency components. Uh, so in the dewatering building where we had the initial sort of um, taking water out of the solid stream, um, there is a lot of air moving in and out of that building. And that is due to um, the combustible nature of the gases that are uh, generated. So essentially we're heating up the building and then we're blowing all that hot air back out um, in the wintertime. And by connecting um, the, uh, some of the equipment that's uh, associated with dewatering to odor control and piping it out of the building rather than having it open to the building, um, that reduces the level of gases and therefore allows us to reduce the number of um, air exchanges in the building. So we won't have to, we'll still have to you know, move air in and out, but not as frequently. I think it's something like 12 times an hour to three or something like that. Okay. Yep. Uh, we're also looking at extending the hot water loop. Um, so that's the, the, the building, the buildings at the plant, all except the chemical building, are all on a singular hot water loop for heating. Um, the chemical building is the only building not connected, so we're uh, planning to extend the loop to connect that. Um, we're also looking at a, a larger evaluation to see if there's an opportunity to connect the heating loop from both the DPW facility, the garage, um, to the plant. Um, even potentially with adding the pellet boiler at the garage to um, allow each of the facilities to sort of supplement each other's heating needs. Um, but that that is really just at this point in the contract is only an evaluation to see how much heat is available um, from these changes, um, excess heat that might be able to go to the garage. So we're not actually designing um, that full uh, system. It's more of an evaluation of the ability to meet those heating demands. Um, and then we're also going to look at um, how much methane capacity we'll have for heating and um, what we can recover uh, out s um, in addition from the thermal drying equipment um, to add to that heating loop. Uh, project schedule, so um, this may change a little bit. I just had a conversation with um, a state funding agency and, and if we, s um, actually uh, finalize everything with this contract uh, July or first or after there's an opportunity for another hundred thousand dollar subsidy so that's likely I'm gonna bump the kickoff meeting back a little bit <laughs> but <laughs> um, this is high level schedule so um, subject to change but and um, we were hoping in May to have the project kickoff meeting maybe that's July now 30% um, uh, in September so that's um, that's when we are hoping to have some um, initial uh, evaluations done on the heating loop uh, and things like that. Um, in October, we hope to have the equipment um, RFP issued. So we, on this project, we hope to bid the equipment purchase outside of the construction contract. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. One, uh, well, two primary reasons. One is uh, the costs are going up very quickly with inflation. Um, uh, and lead times are, are long on this equipment and specialty equipment is essentially manufactured to spec. Um, and then in February 23, we'd do a 60% design workshop 
July of 24 would be 90 percent and then in September we would complete the project bid documents and issue the contract in December of 24 and then we're looking at um, April of 2026 to have the project completed. I'm going to turn it over to Colin to talk about uh, costs. Good evening everybody. Uh, Colin O'Brien with Brown and Caldwell again. Thank you Kurt for the introductions and starting on that. So because there is some we haven't talked about this project maybe in a little while and new council members we wanted to go through the the project finances as well so that first level in this table was a level four uh, AACE cost estimate which is like engineering standard required by Vermont DEC for us to be produced uh, with our PER preliminary engineering report so you'll see there's a range in there again that's pretty standard for cost estimates at this level of project development um, final design and engineering construction services are estimated fees except for the final design that's the one that Kurt has put in the memo in front of the council uh, we use the FED allowance which is uh, Vermont DEC sanctioned um, calculation for how engineering fees are to be estimated so all of our fees associated with this when we did the first round of planning work this design work and the engineering construction services will all be in compliance with that which allows us to get the additional funding uh, for other avenues for this project uh, the next couple slides let me just change that here what we elected to do is the last time we came and presented to council was 2021 2022 and this is when we had came and presented and say well we have these options in front of us this is what we expect the project finances to look like at project midterm so we're talking a, a, a project with a target of the cost savings or cost reductions associated with it similar to the phase one exercise but versus revenue we're offsetting costs in 2021 2022 the, this is the picture that was painted of okay when we look at what are biosolids disposal costs going to potentially be in 10 years we estimated um, the city has a great deal um, with the partnership that they have for the leachate acceptance that that biosolids goes to that same land landfill at a fee that is much more reduced than what other entities in Vermont in New England in the region pay so that is very much so already advantageous in these projects at that time were still cost savings so we take a snapshot to say present and just show really with what we have seen in the last of a very small amount of time right 12 to 18 months from when that table was last developed just on what the trend for biosolids disposal cost is going so you'll see all the options as far as their annualized cost as well from a capital investment increase right with inflation additional cost of of services we did account for that for all options but the real gap between status quo which is what we are currently doing at the plant we're just dewatering and disposing of it in the landfill aside from all of the environmental benefits of doing these advanced thermal processes for biosolids management that cost offset continues to grow in that gap and unfortunately it appears with all of the strains that are being put on biosolids management concerns with PFAS in not only just the water the wastewater the biosolids as well those prices continue to go up Kurt? Um, so some of the opportunities we have to offset these project costs um, we do have a grant and loan package from USDA so it's a low interest loan the total grant amount is three and about three and a half million and that's spread between both this project and the East State Street project uh, really with the city's flexibility to allocate um, whatever percentage they want to the various projects um, we have the um, the clean water state revolving loan fund design subsidies so that's that hundred thousand um, that I uh, mentioned earlier um, there's an opportunity we don't have the grant but there's an opportunity for a pollution control grant so that's um, a fund specifically really for solids management um, issued by the state so that's money specifically dedicated by the state legislature to um, to these types of projects and I think being that we're dealing with emerging contaminants um, as part of this project I think there's a, a very good chance the city could get some a pretty significant grant money through that program 
Uh, Efficiency Vermont has agreed to pay for 50% uh, of the eva uh, heating evaluation, so uh, roughly uh, $12,000 um, that they have just sent the agreement uh, just actually today. Um, and then in the short term, the city would, uh, uh, you know, do short-term bond financing, um, and then we would get reimbursed to the USDA program. And so, uh, sort of to wrap it up, the recommended action is to approve the draft engineering contract with Brown Caldwell for final design of the water resource recovery facility, biosolids drying, clarifier upgrade, and odor control project with minor revisions as may be required by the funding agencies. They have not approved the contract yet. Um, and authorized city managers that's a need to execute the contract and related documents. Questions? Okay, thank you. Um, members of the council have, uh, have any questions? Um, and, and Linda, I, we will get to you. I'll ask, get the council members first. And if nobody else is raising their hands, I'll, I'll start out um, with the... Uh, oh, yeah, why don't we take that out? Mm -hmm. there we go. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so... Just to uh, state the obvious, it's uh, it's a lot of money, <laughs> and and so one question is: is it uh, is there a possible and a possible do nothing option, and would that be a responsible option for us to pursue? Um. I would say uh, the only component of the project that we could cut out is the biosolids component. Um, you know, we have to do the odor control because it's a permit requirement, and um, we have to do the secondary clarifiers because it's um, critical to the operations of the plant. Um, so that that do nothing alternative could ultimately cost the city more than the biosolids project itself, based on projected disposal costs. So. It is an alternative, but in the long run, um, it may not be the best financial option for us. And, th and it also means that we wouldn't be addressing the PFAS component um, that's in the solids. Mm -hmm. And um, is part of what you're asking us to do today is to make the uh, decision of which uh, biosolids uh, Pro uh, project we need to do, or is that is that yet to be designed? Right. So as part of the um, USDA funding requirements, uh, you know you have to competitively select equipment. Um, so the plan is to develop a um, selection matrix, like a sort of a, a point system, based on various criteria for the alternatives, and to have the um, have the equipment vendors submit, and then we would rank them based on. Um, uh, you know, on that matrix that the consultant will develop. So no, we're not asking for the um, the process to be selected. That would come out through uh, the engineering evaluation in conjunction with funding agency approval. Uh, and next to that. Yeah. And just to add to Kurt's point there, too, all of these technologies and the different options that we've talked about, um, my team and the city staff have been to these facilities to get, we felt that if we were going to, put this forward in this way, it should be, we should have hands-on experience, we should be talking with people that are operating this equipment, because as we've heard in other presentations today, this is stuff that is cutting edge as far as the environmental industry is concerned. Um, and I, I would say that that is a, has been a critical component of how we've done the structure that Kurt was just talking about. Uh, we've talked about this pre-procurement with DEC, with USDA, and it's very it's a very creative approach to this project as well, and it allows us to have more flexibility with what the proposals that we receive and review and the scoring matrix and the different categories that we will associate them, so that it's a very cost and non-cost factor-based decision. 
Yeah, just, just one other thing that uh, Colin and I had discussed is we could come back to council at the various um, percent design completion points. So we talked about a 30 and 60, 90 percent review. And um, there's an opportunity if the council decides, you know, they don't want to move forward with the biosolids component, we could stop and give you updates at those points in the design work, and you could have a discussion review on that. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, uh, do, do all the, would, would all the project have to be engineered, designed, and constructed essentially at the same time? Is there a way to stage it, for instance, to get the, uh, to accelerate the uh, deployment of the odor reduction component of it? Because I know that that's been a sore spot for neighbors. I think the, how we envision the project being delivered right now is that everything will be advanced to that 30% design. And we'll have those proposals in hand for the advanced biosolids processing, and we can make that decision. Moving forward from that point, if the city were to choose to pause on the biosolids, not pro procure that equipment, we'd obviously have to coordinate that with the regulatory and funding agencies based on how we've qualified the project. But it would be an option to proceed after having those discussions with the agencies with just those improvements. Understand, I'm not saying that I, I don't think we should do the bio, biosolids part of it. I'm just sure. exploring. I yeah. think the question, though, was not could we proceed with one or the other. Is there any way to accelerate the part about over odor control? Yes. At that same component, we could work. Our intent is, once we get to 30 Prezine, to talk about other alternatives with pre-procurement as far as the odor control. Understanding, I understand the question now. Understanding okay. how important odor control is with this project. Okay, thanks. Donna. Uh, Kurt, am I, I don't know that I can call this phase two, phase three. You've come back so many times. But this has always been in the vision that we were going to de have to deal with. Um, and so I, I see... Uh, that this is a progression, and I would hope that you'd be coming back to us again and again, but I don't, I've seen every step we've taken is to get here, and to get here sooner because the cost only goes up. We know we need to do this. So I would hope the council would get, give a, a green light to mo keep going. Any other members of the council in the room who have questions at this point? Um, any members of the council on the online who have questions? If not, we'll uh, go to members of the public. And Linda Berger, I see your hand up as, as expected. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I'm from District 1. I'm downwind from the plant, so I'm pretty interested in this. Kurt's been very patient with me. I've appreciated it. Um, we started experiencing really bad odors from the plant. I was um, emailing uh, Chris Cox way back in 2018 when this uh, the first when this most current upgrade of the plant was done. Um, organics and and energy was the priority over odor. Odor wasn't even considered in the construction. So it's been a while that we've been on the back burner in terms of air quality. I have a couple of questions, two questions. Um, what is and will be in place to monitor car carbon dioxide, methane, and other biogas emissions from the plant? You go ahead first. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, as part of this project, we will have to get uh, an air quality permit from DEC. And there will be um, testing requirements associated with that. I don't believe it's going to be continuous monitoring, but it will be, um, you know, initial testing to establish, um, you know, that we're meeting the air quality permit conditions. Is that, is that fair? That's fair. And in addition to that, as part of the preliminary engineering report that was conducted, there was actual physical odor sampling conducted at the plant to identify the types of odors that are being experienced so that the technology that's implemented fully addresses those low odors. The plant currently, um, as life safety hazards, has methane detection in some of the occupied spaces. And when these new types of technology uh, for odor control are put online, we do have 
startup commissioning testing that they all had to have, have to adhere to. And as Kurt indicated, through these upgrades, the plant will needing to be put together an air quality management plan for approval by Vermont DEC, which will stipulate how those will be needed to be mon monitored from a timing perspective, whether that's quarterly, annually, biannually, whatever the termination is on that. My second question is, um, you indicated that DEC is going to limit ammonia levels. Um, my understanding is that high organic waste contributes to ammonia levels, and it also it degrades the digestion at the plant, and it also imp uh, negatively impacts the infrastructure, is my understanding, high ammonia levels. So are you adjusting amounts of high organic waste you're accepting? And if so, what's the impact on revenue of that? Uh, I'll speak to the revenue piece. I'm not familiar with um, some of the other uh, impacts that you noted, but um, so we uh, we have never really hit capacity of the organic waste. You know, it is a competitive market, um, it, and it's very uh, up and down. So um, it seems like most places um, clean their grease traps kind of all at the same time. So we might get a, a bunch of or fat soils and grease kind of all at once, and then it and then it'll drop drop way off. Um, so we don't have plans to uh, change uh, organic waste. I don't know that, um, that that significantly contributes to ammonia or not, but I'll leave that part to Colin to answer. Ammonia contributions to the plant are not likely the origin of the high-strength waste. Um, when the high-strength waste is brought to the facility, it's sampled based on what is in it so that the plant can evaluate what they're taking. Ammonia loading can be found in other types of waste, but I guess... You know, when we're talking about the types of, this makes sense, the types of high-strength waste, right, we talked about dairy products, some of these brewery waste, it's, it's very variable to the individual product, the industry that it's coming from. So I guess, Linda, to answer that more directly, some of those wastes can be more potent, but others are nearly have no impact compared to the normal wastewater streams that they're seeing at the plant. As far as the corrosivity or the increased uh, to the infrastructure when that high strength waste is priced right because all those folks come to the plant they pay a tipping fee to dispose of it the waste the associated cost impacts with having to treat that waste are part of part of that cost and part of that consideration when staff makes their rates thank you excellent so uh, yeah thanks um I thought I heard uh, when you were talking about the pyrolysis, you know, the gasification and the um, uh, the pyrolysis, the, the, you were saying that the biosolids provide the fuel, but you also said the biosolids contain PFAS. Are we are we burning biosolids and releasing PFAS into the air, or what, did I misunderstand? No, great question. Um, so as part of, to make the biosolids issue even more complicated, when we add thermal technologies, you're exactly right. There is combustion going on. Thankfully, these technologies, and as they're being introduced into the wastewater field, have what's called best available technology for emission controls device. These are thermal oxidizers. These are chemical scrubbers that physically process the air that is emitted from these stacks. Um, Recently, in our experience, similar to earlier presentation today, the PFAS limits in emissions for wastewater treatment plants and air quality management permits does not exist at the moment. So we are going off of data that we are working with, with industry organizations that our firm is working with, that these entities that have full-scale commercial applications of these facilities that have sampled those emissions to confirm there is no detectable PFAS in the emission. So to get back to the origin of the question, there are control devices that are going to be fully intended to be implemented as part of this project to manage that just as we are doing with the combustion process associated with processing the biosolids as well as in the air. Well, it was just an interesting contrast, uh, having just heard from Casella, who's encasing the PFAS in foam and concrete and burying it for 10,000 years. And we're, we're using scrubbers. Um, so I, I you know, it just seems to me we ought to make sure that our, our technologies 
are at least um, as good as, uh, well, we should set a standard uh, for the PFAS removal or mitigation that is consistent throughout. And I don't know if that's, if there's a way of testing that or measuring that, or if it's part of the of the design uh, study, but it, it seems to me it should be. Yeah. Yes, uh, agreed, and, and great point there. One component that I left out, the PFAS, as it goes through those chemical scrubbers, it drops out into the liquid. The liquid is then treated through carbon, and as Casella noted, uh, PFAS is very absorbent by carbon, so that would be a disposed material. As far as the advancement of the air control devices, that is fully planned to be a part of the project and whatever is selected for the technology, and we feel that those technologies are existing, being implemented, and viable. Thank you. It's like we will be in the PFAS removal business at some point, which I think we need to be. Okay. Anything else from Council or from members of the public? If not, I would be prepared to entertain a motion to approve the uh, contract. I can word it very simply that I make a motion to approve the contract. Yes, I think that's good enough for the clerk. And if it's good enough for the clerk, it's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And is there a second? Second. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. The motion carries, and we've approved the contract uh, as requested by the Department of Public Works. And I'm looking at the time. It, it is 8.25. Uh, we'll take a 10-minute break. All right, we will call the meeting back to order. And before uh, before we go to Country Club Road, we have uh, some business to take care of from the previous item. Thank you. I thought there was a way that that uh, Public Works needed this uh, motion that I just made as far as approving the contract a little more specific. So I would like to make a motion that expands that. And it says that I make a motion to approve the final design contract with Brown and Caldwell for the project with revisions as needed based on the funding agency comments and authorize the city manager or his designee to execute contract and associated documents. And is there a second to that motion? This, okay. A any discussion? The, the point of this is just to make explicit all the points that were set forth in the uh, in the presentation. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Thank you. All right, now we are up to item number 11, or number 12, Country Club Road update. Uh, welcome, Great. Stephanie. Thank you. Did you want to say anything? And welcome, Josh. This and is Josh. Josh. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he works yeah. for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stephanie doesn't work here? <laughs> you'd think I did. Um, good evening, everybody. Stephanie Clark with White & Burke Real Estate Advisors, consulting to the city, um, working with the master planning team, Josh Jerome, Evelyn Prim, and Kelly Murphy on this project. And Dave Saladino is remote on Zoom. Um, he's our consultant um, from VHB, and he'll be popping in if we can technologically make sure that works well um, to, to review a little bit. But up, my, my purpose tonight is to go through the update fairly quickly because a lot there was a lot of information in your packets. and. Um, Actually, most of you were at attendance or had been in touch about the process during the last month. So we'll go through um, the update and then really leave time for some good questions. I didn't know if they, if the lights, if anyone needed to turn lights down for that. Let's see if I know how to do this. Okay. So um, 
Uh, just to recap, phase this is the phase one of the master planning process for the Country Club Road property that was acquired last spring. The community input um, began more in earnest in the fall when the consultant team was brought on and we did a lot of community conversations at the time and due diligence on the site. In the winter, we then had an opportunities and constraints plan that we were able to show with different test sketches for the community to respond to and give us some feedback on. We did surveys, we did workshops, we did stakeholder meetings. And finally, it brings us to spring when we did, we met with you back in March and then uh, opened up a series of meetings and different outreach efforts to look at the concept plans. So three different concept plans, kind of schematic, high level visions for the site that will be associated and brought into the actionable master plan, which is where we find ourselves today. Um, so this is just a, a quick recap of where we were for the last few months, but you see that today, May 24th, we're here to discuss a decision from the city council on a direction for the visionary plan, concept plan that gets incorporated into our actionable master plan document that is the summation of this phase and that will be presented in June. So in the spring we had several meetings. We did um, three three different site meetings, three different meetings in public. We did uh, increased messaging throughout the community and through all types of uh, outreach that we put in a in a memo to the council in, a, in your packet. So if you had any questions about that it's in um, the packet, but we did see a, w a way, we created a feedback loop where we were talking with different constituents and uh, consulting with different folks about how to increase our messaging and our outreach with every single iteration because we, we met with people in the fall, the winter, and the spring. Um, and we had really solid engagement this past sp this past month, especially for the seasonality, which has to be taken into account when you talk about public process in Vermont. <laughs> so we did our meetings in the fall, the winter, and the spring, and the spring saw fewer attendees overall, but still a lot of substantive feedback. And we had a lot of feedback and questions that are informing how we write the actionable master plan. We also got questions from council that we incorporated into our frequently asked questions that helped uh, educate a lot of folks and people that were asking similar questions from the community. But where we got to through that phase and through all this past nine months that we've been doing this is to really hone in on these goals. These are the goals for the site and that the this is where the community has landed on what is the desired impact of the site. So addressing the high, high housing need by providing a mix of housing product with affordable and workforce housing and market, market rate units, so a whole mix. Addressing the need for the indoor and outdoor recreational opportunities, including a facility or a building, um, as well as fields, courts, and other uses. Um, balancing all of that with the list of things that I won't read off the screen, but you know, a whole bunch of other types of integrated uses that, that people want to see on the site. And to do that <laughs> while minimizing impact on climate and minimizing impact to taxpayers. So that's the, that's the goal, that's the vision, that's the impact that, that people want to make with this site, that the community wants to make with this site. So we had three concepts that were pr um, released in the spring to the community and then these were put out in a survey to everybody to ask who, which, which concept people supported the most. So for these concepts, I'm going to turn it over to Dave in just a moment to walk us through the three concepts a little bit more in specifics, but kind of in general, these are the ones you saw in April. We, we did submit this um, same packet of concept plans in April, but they have all a similar road network and similar depiction of trails, not exact locations, but ideas of trails, the U32 trail, possible connections to the north or the west, showing how that could um, would be necessary to have a secondary access, but where that would be is to, to be de determined. They, they all three show a recreation zone, a recreation and community zone, which is a, a par part of the parcel that's being held for that those uses, but going to be planned and programmed in a separate parallel process. And at least 80% in all three plans has been designated natural area again, to reflect the feedback we got from the community and council over the last nine months. They, um, 
differ between the three in product mix and variation on layout. And, but again, I think the fact that there isn't a wide variety of plans at this stage is a real testimony to the strength of the process and the consensus building that had been done very intentionally and very um, mindfully over the last uh, series of months with this, with this process. I want to make a very uh, important point here, and we kept emphasizing this throughout all the public sessions, but keep in mind that this is not a final land plan. It is not a final design, and this is not to be viewed in isolation from the document that's coming out in June that has the data and recommendations for how to achieve these um, this vision. This is really a visionary document that is uh, a roadmap more than anything. So I'd like to ask Dave to hop in and talk about the plans. I'm going to try to give him remote control. You can click Dave and hey. maybe folks can see you, but maybe they can't. At least they can hear you. <laughs> Is that, can you see my mouse and can yes. you hear me? Yes and yes. OK. Thank you, Steph. And um, thank you, um, City Council. Um, I, I know many of you have seen uh, these plans, so we will, and uh, Stephanie did a great introduction. So just um, we'll go through some high-level differences between the three concepts. Um, and, and really, the largest difference between the three is the density and number of housing units across the three. And so as we start here in concept A, this is the most dense, as, as the most number of units, um, just under 300 units, so 292 total shown here. Um, just for anyone who's seeing this for the first time, just to orient you, kind of at the bottom towards the right is the Country Club Road uh, intersection with Route 2. Um, you can kind of see Route 2 crossing um, the Winooski River there at the bottom right. Uh, and then heading north is the 131-acre parcel. Um, so as you come off of Country Club Road, you can see the big green blob area that's reserved for future uh, discussions around community and recreational uh, uses there. So that, that 12 acres has been reserved for future use. Um, and then passing through that area, you can see the road network um, is consistent in each of the three concepts. Uh, in this concept A, we have kind of that first cluster of red buildings there, which um, are multifamilies of five-story buildings. First story would be parking, four stories of residential above, uh, 196 units total in that cluster of red buildings. Uh, we see community gardens there in the center of that, the, the cluster of buildings. Um, and, uh, and so then heading north from there, we see the orange buildings, townhouses. Excuse, excuse me, the, Dave. Uh, can I jump? Can I jump in here and suggest Please. if you have the ability to do that to sort of use your cursor to uh, okay. yeah. show show people where on the map everything is? I know it's it's tiny on my screen, but uh, that would yeah. be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, that, that is a good suggestion. Thank you. So here is this is that first cluster of the red buildings here. So 100 and just under 200 units here, the five-story buildings. Um, the idea is really to kind of step back with density as you head further into the uh, into the site. So we start off with five-story buildings here, uh, and then we have um, two to three-story townhouses here in the orange. And so those would be anything from duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, really um, building off of whatever the demand market demand is at the time. Um, as we've laid it out here, there's 96 total units of the the townhouses that are labeled as townhouses here. So all in total, we have uh, 292 units total, so just uh, just under 300 um, housing residential units in this concept A. Um, before moving on to the other two concepts, just to, to highlight a couple of things that Stephanie mentioned, um, you can see here this this purple line here. This is the proposed um, uh, U32 trail that kind of um, snakes through the northern side of the of the lot here and through the the gullies to the west. Um, we are showing kind of conceptually dry uh, uh, road extensions off to the north and west. And these are very high high level concepts. If there is an interest in connecting to the west over to the Sabine pasture or to points to the north, those would be likely kind of alignments or orientations for those those roadways. Um, as as Stephanie also mentioned, 80 percent of the of the parcels and all 80 uh, percent of the entire parcel is reserved for natural uses. And so you can see those the kind of the western area, most of the southern portion of the site, and then the eastern portion are all reserved or are are not contemplated for use. Um, and then finally, just one thing to note here, the, the green um, circles on here are existing trees, mature trees on the site. Um, 
when this moves forward, when this uh, gets into further design, there will certainly be much more landscaping, streetscape amenities, and other features on the site. Um, what we're just showing here are the existing trees on the site. We want to make sure that we're preserving and acknowledging the fact that there are uh, lots of uh, mature trees on the site. We made sure to lay out the site to avoid impacting those existing trees. So that's, um, that is concept A, so 292 total units. Um, and then if we move here down to concept B, it's essentially the same. So coming in from the south, we've got the 196 units of uh, five-story residential here. We still have that cluster of townhouses um, here, uh, if you can see my mouse, and then here in this location. The big change here in concept B is to reflect some single-family homes. So we do have um, a series of single-family homes here at the end of the roadway. This is really um, uh, responding to some comments that we received after the winter round of public outreach that um, there was some level of interest in seeing a concept with single-family homes. Uh, so essentially everything else remains the same in this concept B. Uh, and then concept C, as we're stepping down in density and total number of units, this is the least dense of the three. Uh, this is uh, 184 total units. And um, so kind of two, two big diff changes here from the first two concepts. Um, first off, in this initial cluster that you come to, uh, we have the darker red or the brownish kind of C-shaped building. That is a five-story building, um, uh, like the others. So four stories of residential, one story parking below. Uh, but then these other two are, are, um, are smaller, three-story buildings here, um, so providing a little bit less uh, you know, height and density right at the entryway. Um, so this brings in a total of 132 units. And then we carry through the, uh, the townhouses uh, back here, as shown on the, on the previous sketches. So all in total, we have uh, 184 units uh, on this concept. This obviously, without this uh, cluster of housing here, leaves more open space for things like a sledding hill or some more recreational, passive recreational uses or other uses of that, that kind of north east squadron of the site. Thank you, Dave. So we will have time, obviously, at the end for questions. We're going to hold questions for now and keep moving through the presentation. Um, and this next section we're getting into is the cost and the finance side of things. We had promoted the video that we um, recorded going through this in a lot more depth. And so if hopefully if we're going to go really high level with this summary because there was a lot more information available for the last month and a half for both the public and the council. So, um, But if you have more questions after, we can definitely get to them. So. Essentially, the city infrastructure cost, the way we look at this, is what the city would need to incur to support these, this, these development concepts. And we're looking at the city's cost for infrastructure, not individual units or driveways or you know, um, um, the actual you know, plantings for the, for the residential units. But these are also order of magnitude only estimates. This is early phase. This is phase one. We are just doing this to show a general spectrum across the different scenarios, the three, three concepts, with a lot more knowing there's a lot more due diligence in store. And these have also been done pretty conservatively using um, today's dollars and looking at different assumptions. So just to summarize this slide, this shows the three scenarios, A, B, and C, the three concepts, and it shows just the buckets of costs on-site, off-site, and what we're calling sunk costs. The on-site is road connections, water sewer lines, the possible connection to an abutting property line, uh, property um, for, in, for a road and the roundabout that would be needed in concepts A and B only would not be necessary in concept C. What we're calling off-site costs is the pump station that would need to be upgraded off-site and the water sewer to upgrade those lines to get to the, very, um, the uh, intersection with Country Club Road. And then sunk costs is really the purchase price of the site as well as due diligence costs that we would be associating with this development and you can see that for offsite costs and sunk costs, those three remain the same for all three scenarios because for this level of density and development, whether you're talking about A with 292 units or C with 184 units, you'd have those same costs. So you can see that our high level estimates are saying about 18.8 .8 million for both A and B because they have remarkably similar infrastructure demand regardless of you know the difference in, de in unit count. And Concept C is lower at 15.3 million. So what we want to highlight with those costs, this is the important piece, which is that as you're contemplating which concept you want to support, concept A and B comp are comparable gross cost. Concept C 
is less costly overall, but because it has lowest density, you can see in that next uh, bullet, the go gross cost per unit goes up with concept C. And again, this is unit from the city's perspective. This is not how to build a residential unit, but this is the infrastructure cost. So, and as we said, the community and recreation zone is not yet known at this phase, so this is isolating just the infrastructure to support housing. So we were tasked with looking at funding and financing because as the city needs to contemplate both the, con the community um, constituents who, who participated, but also city council, it's important to think about how would we make this work? How could this possibly be funded before you make any kind of um, decision to point the direction for our next steps in the due diligence? And essentially, this is, gonna, this is a very high level recap. If we have more questions, we can get into it. But we already, the city has already invested a million dollars in the site. The, we went through a quick exercise of what kind of grants we might be able to obtain. Pretty much they would apply to any of the three scenarios, so we estimate a, a conservative assumption of 1.5 million. So that number in the green is what, what we would need to find funding for. So the municipal bond, you know, instead of trying to say that that needs to be funded by the taxpayer, how could you finance that and fund that? So the 16.3 for concepts A and B or 12.8 for concept C is really the nut we were trying to crack. So we did a, an assessment, and I'm not going to go through what is TIF tonight. Um, we've done that a lot at these meetings, um, but if you have more questions, especially members of the public, this is all available on the website. Um, if the city were to do a municipal-only TIF, which is retaining increment that the city uh, grand that would otherwise go to the city grand list from the pro the parcels, the properties on this site, you could conceivably close that gap considerably under scenarios A, B, and C, and you can see that line is about 2.9 million to about 5.7 million. So you bring down the debt quite a bit that would end up being needed to be funded by taxpayers using just a municipal only TIF, which is within the city's control. If you add in water sewer fees, which is also something the city could choose to do independent of any other agency, you actually would have a surplus under concept A, and under concepts B and C, you close that gap considerably again. But if you were to be able to get a state designated TIF district, which is not a guarantee by any means, there's a whole process, it's a bigger bigger uh, concept for a bigger part of the community. But if there was nexus there, you could actually see that there would be a surplus generated by those units to fund possibly the recreation part of the site as well, and would also, but also fund the entirety of that housing infrastructure. So again, the takeaways here is that the city would continue to seek grants, of course, to continue to bring down that number. But even so, with the assumptions we've made, you can see the different ways that bringing down the overall debt could be achievable using these different tools, municipal only, muni uh, water sewer fees, or a state TIF district. I just want to be clear that a state TIF district is a much bigger process, and you would have to absolutely show the nexus of the infrastructure being built for the recreation community zone, um, incentivizing and catalyzing the private development to be able to use that surplus. But there is a scenario, and that should be looked at comprehensively. That's part of the plan, is to run those two parallel processes and merge them soon. But that's um, an important takeaway. Again, much more due diligence is needed. We're going to get clearer in the next phases on design, engineering, permitting implications, and that could increase costs. So these numbers should not be things that we're getting wedded to. They are order of magnitude, and that, but that could also open up possible funding sources, too. This also does not assume any developer contribution. So as a partnership evolves with a developer, that could op open up other funding opportunities. And um, we also don't know what the recreational programming could provide in terms of financing. What we want to highlight again tonight for council is that this is a vote. Tonight is not really even a vote on any kind of um, capital spend, there's no bonding costs at this point in phase one. It is not a vote on spending. It is really a focus on the vision for what this site n could be so that the phase two and beyond can go forward with due diligence and next steps. 
So when we went to the public back in the last few months, we talked with, we, we asked for a vote after we had lots of public education and these meetings, and we asked for survey results, uh, people to participate in the survey, and the the majority, I would say, it's for its first choice is 48% compared to the um, concepts B and C, which had 21 and 31% support respectively. So concept A was the um, preferred choice from our survey. And then part of our task as the consultant team was to make a recommendation as well. And we would agree that concept A is the better option for pursuing at this point, and that is because it does achieve your highest ROI, your return on investment. It shows the highest density with still a very low footprint. You're talking less than 20% of the entire site having impervious. Um, it also hits all those goals we talked about and maximizes the, your site efficiency balancing the two recreation and housing uses. So where we're going with this, again, I want to broaden our view out of the individual land map that you saw that Dave walked us through and focus on what this document is going to provide you in the next month, which is this actionable master plan. It has a lot of components and these are only some of them, but you know, we're talking about recommendations for going forward to the city that that's what this pl whole process has been about is to hone in on what are those next steps based on the vision that the community has set forward. So we have a, a plan, a vision document um, graphically that kind of gives us a bit of a uh, target and that is not a final design plan because that's going to evolve with developers being involved, development partners being involved, but there's a lot of other steps and you can see some of them listed here. Um, the document will also include all the findings from this past year and the due diligence that was done on the site so that there's a solid foundation for the city to continue pursuing this site development of a scale on a scale this large. So I want to focus just on the recap before I, uh, I turn back over to you for your discussion of what we're asking for tonight, which is, you know, again, the goals here, these are the goals, I won't reread re them, but these are the goals that the community has set forward that we think are going to be front and center, top of the document, and then a plan that goes with it. We're recommending concept A, but that's for you to decide tonight, and that it's really the two together that form this overall um, actionable master plan. So the ask tonight is for the council to to review and think about and do you endorse the goals that have been set forward and then which concept plan should be incorporated and what I want to just make it very clear this is not a binding decision by any means because this is intended to evolve and it's not a final design and there's no commitment to debt at this point or commitment to a any spending actually at this stage, but rather it directs our team to finish our work here in phase one, which is to finish the master plan, finish the document that has the recommendations. The number one recommendation you'll see is going to be following the adoption of and the acceptance of this master plan. The city council and city management are going to need to go through the steps and choose which ones to prioritize and tackle because um, there's four or five pages of recommendations in terms of the next steps that have to be done before this could ever be achieved. So how do you triage that? And so we, in order to do our work and finish our work, we need one of the plans as a vision to, to be um, heading toward. And that finishes my piece here and happy to answer questions. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, So I've got a couple of questions. I'm sure other members do also. Uh, you had the slide you showed us with the picture of the actionable master plan, which had a bunch of boxes with, uh, with little items on it. And is, the idea is that the actionable master plan will address each one of those items. Good question. Um, yes, 
sort of. <laughs> so those are a sample of the things that we're recommending in the recommendations section of the master plan, and each one will have an explanation of what that is and what needs to be looked at. For example, um, the, we met with representatives from the Abnaki community during our due diligence in the public outreach process and determined that it didn't make sense, it was not appropriate to locate actual Abnaki spaces on the site today, but rather we want the city, we would encourage the city to form a working group with city stakeholders and community representatives to actually put together um, intentional mindful processes around putting, uh, locating sites within the actual, this site, but also around the city beyond just this one site. So we'll explain that in a, in a paragraph or two within the document and that's what those represent mm -hmm. or for instance there is a box about zoning mm -hmm. you're not going right. to say you're not going to write the zoning no. ordinance for that area but it'll say yeah. here's what you need to do with zoning in order to uh, how to tackle accomplish it. Yeah. in order to put what you want to put on this site yeah yeah and, and outline it as a step mm -hmm. yeah and we've got numbers mm -hmm. and um is part of the process that uh, as we select uh, one of these options that will enable you to get to more concrete uh, not numbers? in this phase okay so the numbers that you saw depending on which concept are just going to be inserted in the document as they are to represent the estimates we determined during phase one mm -hmm. and then there will be many of the steps lead to more concrete and sharpening the pencil on a lot of that which which inevitably is going to happen yeah and just to talk about how you get to these uh, mm -hmm. cost estimates mm -hmm. for instance um, to we don't know exactly what the layout is going to be but mm -hmm. you have and you have a figure for, as drawn on the map, yeah. how many uh, linear feet of right. road. And so from that, you can right. get an estimate of uh, yep. of paving and that exactly. kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, those sources came from VHB um, and their team, and they created um, the the linear they did they sketched out the the, the linear feet for those numbers um, we actually went a different route with the water sewer numbers using DPW numbers to try to get something more specific to Montpelier because you have local data there um, recent local data so yeah different data sources pulled it together but to give specific numbers to those weren't arbitrarily chosen they were done based on linear fit footage and um, we have a model that that ran to, to produce those numbers and different designs mm -hmm. change it change absolutely it a bit. yeah okay. and you know 2023 costs versus this isn't going to be built for several years <laughs> so those numbers are going to go up mm -hmm. with inflation inevitably okay that's that's it for me for right now um who's who wants to go next um palin um thank you Stephanie. very nice presentation uh, now it is more clear for me because we have numbers uh, in the plan and the uh, presentation uh, and every single time we talk about cost it's raising right it's getting higher and higher so it really concerns me and um, I will not ask any questions to you because as far as I understood public decided and they want to go with the concept A, which really helps me um, to decide uh, what to do about project. But I will make a general comment. Uh, one thing is very concerning me that we are trying to find financial resources to our other issues like infrastructure, our roads, like shelter for unhoused people. We are just you know, calculating, oh, can we find that much money? And, oh, we cannot do this because our budget is not allowing us. Then we are trying to commit our city and taxpayers a project that it will um, be more expensive every year. So it's a general comment I just want to share with the city council and public. So thank you. 
can I respond in one way, which is um, I totally hear that, Pellin, and I think one of the things that um, we've seen in our work in other communities who similarly are strug struggling to find the right resources for the right uses and com um, needs of their communities is that you know, this ultimately comes back to the taxpayers for the re their review. You know, if there was a bond boat that was going to create a general obligation bond to, that would be paid for with taxes, it would have to come to the voters. Any bond would have to come back to the voters and show the revenue stream. And so that will be the time at which the community can make a decision and the city council will make a decision. But, you know, as we showed in those financing ideas, um, those are specific to economic development, that those are the only kinds of resources Though these are, this is the only kind of project those resources could be used for is the infrastructure. So in that way, it's utilizing a resource that would otherwise go untapped. Um, and so it could be a way to do a project. And I'm not saying it's a guarantee. So, you know, in that scenario where it doesn't close the gap entirely, then you have definitely the decision you're talking about. But if you could, you know, you're using a, a tool to self-fund this particular infrastructure project, which inevitably grows your grand list, and that grand list helps now defray costs elsewhere in the city. So just a point on process, but I, I hear your point completely, and it's not unique to this community either. A lot of communities have that same issue. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Sal? Thanks. Um, uh, Stephanie, my, uh, you know, I, I appreciate your efforts to clarify, uh, the, you know, the conceptual nature of what people have been looking at. I think there's some confusion in the community as to what, uh, you know, what the drawings are all about and, and what constitutes a master plan. The way I've been thinking. We just lost you, Sal. We just, you just went on mute. Sorry. Uh, must have my button. Um, the way I've been. Oh. And again. There, don't touch anything. My cursor right on the mic. Yeah. Oh. oh, no. And again. Oh, that's so frustrating. How's that? There. Good? Yep. Um, I've been thinking about it as, you know, we're, we're really deciding on a, um, you know, the number of units roughly and the level of funding. But we're also... I mean, you've got a list of goals there. And one of the worries that I have for this entire project, I don't see the word affordability among the goals at all. It used to be sort of the watchword for this project and it appears to have disappeared. It also means different things to different people. And what I worry about is that by the time we're done with this, we're, we're just going to create more of what we've got. Um, which is to say prices that that uh, a small only a small segment of the population can afford um and i just i wonder if we if we can explore um other alternatives i mean it seems to me that one of the advantages the city has pretty sorry Sal, you muted again sorry one one of the advantages i think the city has with this property is that we own it and we control it. And I think we ought to hang on to that for as long as we can. If it, if we simply, I mean, we we're going to need partners, but if we simply leave it to developers, I, I just think they're going to do what they, what they've always done. Um, I also wonder as a sort of a secondary question is, will, will there be any indication of, uh, I mean, if we've got almost 300 units here, is there any uh, evaluation of how this will affect the uh, population of school children in the community and how fast that might happen and what the consequences of are that at our for the school infrastructure? And I'll stop now because apparently my microphone doesn't want to cooperate. Thank you. I can respond to one element of that, and mm -hmm. then Josh could probably respond to more about the schools. But um, yeah, I think one of the things you hit upon, and it is in the it is in the document, and it was in the memo about affordability. That's absolutely one of the key goals about what the product mix needs to include: affordable units, workforce units, and possibly market rate units, um, because there was such strong support for an integration of different product type and integration of people that would live there. Um, 
um, different, you know, people that want to downsize, people who have, um, you know, no, you know, no, no children who want to live in a single place, but then people who want children who are going to live a, with a community garden and a rec center right next door. Um, so really serving a lot of different populations. And so that's absolutely part of the mix. But um, I think your point is is well taken, and we, we, we have it again baked into the plan, which is about strategic development partners. And that's where the city plays such a critical role. This is a public-private partnership. Like, this cannot be, it's not a simple sale of a property off without any kind of discussion or, or partnership or agreement because this would be the RFP going out to a community to specific developers that you're interested in partnering with um, who, who can help you achieve those particular goals you're trying to work toward um, and may bring creative and innovative resources to the table to help defray costs and achieve these goals in different ways. And so I think that's, that piece is what's really different about this project than just the city acquiring a piece of property and selling it off to the the, f the highest bidder it's more of a partnership because you're in control being the ones who are investing in the infrastructure to achieve the goals you're looking for so that would be that's that's the hope that's the recommendation we're making and then the question about schools i think josh yeah the school district is not at all concerned um about over um getting too many kids in the school system they have a they have a declining population as it is right now um, and because of a lack of housing, they've had uh, challenges uh, getting educators um, hired and moved to Vermont. Um, so they encourage um, plenty of housing to be developed in the community. Great, thanks. I, I hadn't heard anything on that, so I appreciate that. It would be, I, I think there are other questions uh, too, but it's just uh, what you were saying, Stephanie, just uh, raised a question in my mind. If you could talk a little bit about what we do with the master plan once we get it <laughs> yeah yeah that's a great question um it's it's kind of a question to you i mean we we put in the in the plan the first recommendation is for after adoption of the document which is kind of where our work ends um the city council and city management have to have to create a way to prioritize and um, triage basically the list of recommendations and how to tackle those next steps what are the most important what are the most critical um, you know rezoning for example that takes a long time so how do you get that started sooner than later because then the growth center designation needs to be extended before you could ever even consider having a TIF district so there's a sequencing there um, you know starting conversations with those strategic development partners is another important one early on you know fostering relationships with the types of developers or development organizations or groups that could be the developers of these parcels is going to take time to, to foster those so you know that's a step that needs to happen following June 28th among you all and we we our, our work ends there that's where our scope ends we could pop in and facilitate in some way but that's up to you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Tim. One question on your presentation. Um, just I don't really understand under the um, hypothetical financing mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And there's the middle one, which is um, using muni only TIF and water sewer fees. Mm -hmm. So how do the water sewer fees play into that? Yeah, you can use water sewer fees to pay for water sewer infrastructure only. And so if you use the water sewer fees from the site development itself and use that as a financing stream, you could fund the water sewer lines on the site itself. Okay. But then you the use those fees. first. New fees. Yes. New just new. That that are created yeah, by yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. So thanks. I think so my understanding from our conversations has been that we keep using the term actionable master plan because it's a planning term and it's the term people use. Mm -hmm. But... This is not the master plan. It, it's just a progress plan. It's based on all the feedback that's been garnered through this process, which has been, a, I think, a nice process. Um, I don't think this project's going to look anything like this when it's done. Um, I really hope it doesn't. I, I don't like this plan. I think it really is just one plan with three versions. And um, I think there are ways to get the community values into a plan that once we get the numbers, once the engineering's done, I think that's really going to guide us. And I, I think till we have that to approve anything, 
it's just not, it's folly. Um, this piece, I think, I, personally, because we haven't really had a chance to express it, I would like to see more density up front. I think there's way too much street on this, which is going to result in a lot more development cost. Um, and uh, it's a real, you know, 70s, 80s looking subdivision layout in some ways. I, it just doesn't grab me. I really would like to see a lot more density down. And I also think we need to see more pods or phases where development can happen and we can bring partners in kind of at more of a Montpelier scale. You know, the really large chunks, if you're looking at one like big developer to show up, that's nothing we've seen here in the past. So maybe it can happen, mm -hmm. but it never has before. And so maybe we need smaller phases that we could bring developers in that we know that can do what we want them to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it needs, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a step along the way. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think people should come out of this tonight feeling the city council endorsed. This is a master plan that's going to happen just this way. I think no, it's not. It's not a final design at all. And to that end, I think one of the things that um, the city council in particular, but especially city councilors with um, vested interests and connections are going to be critical for is the seeking out of development partners that are creative, who've done things in other parts of the country, who are, or other parts of the state, other parts of the region, country might be aspirational, um, <laughs> sorry, but, um, but, you know, people who've done things we really, we really like that could bring, bring some innovation. And so multiple times within the document itself, we talk about how important it is that um, this not be inflexible, that this be completely, you know, as long as it's achieving the goals that, you know, don't get tied to 292 units. Because if someone can come back with 500 units, but done in a way that builds it into the landscape and still achieves those other goals, that needs to be considered. And so there's a lot of room for that consideration in the plan that could be, a, that would be adopted because it's based on the framework of the rules, not the framework of a drawing. So to your point, I, I, I do agree. Okay. Uh, do you have another question or comment at this point? I mean, the only thought then would be just because we don't know till we get further into this and have some data so you can go to the state and find out what they're going to want from us. Right. But like if that second access road ends up being something that has to happen, if you break however many units the state decides, um, I mean, that could well double, if not more than double, the cost of this project and blow it out of the water or force us back to a very small project. So I think we just have to be wary that all there's some really big factors here that are still going to affect the direction this thing takes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Donna. No, I totally agree, Tim, that this is, this is just, again, a path. And I felt that we needed, the public, myself, needed at least a concept A to have something to go from. But I don't see the placement of the buildings, but I do see that attitude of townhouses and larger buildings that are more apartment-like, whether it's a condo or a co-op or whatever. And that the, that the more we can do that, the more whatever the economy is five years from now or whenever it gets built, it will be better than if it were single houses spread all over the fields. And so I, I like that the fact that we go back to those goals, that sheet, that she provided us. These are our goals. And one of the actionable plans within this plan, I, I hate master plan, I hate <laughs> the word master, <laughs> but uh, of the actionable plan is to talk to developers, try to find some creative partners. And maybe likewise, we have landowners on the other side, outside of Montpelier, who may want some advantage of that road and, as well as utilities. So I think it gives us some real clear places to go. So it's not a dream that's unattainable, but it has a lot of moving parts that aren't decided, but they are a little better defined than when we started. That's where I'm at. Carrie. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm also, hmm, I, uh, what I'm concerned about is that we say, oh, we like this one and the message that the public gets is that this is the plan that's happening. And I understand that it's not set in stone and it's not an actual plan, but, but because we're being asked to um, approve finer and finer refinements of the ideas, 
really does seem like we're being asked to kind of narrow down into an actual plan. And um, I also agree with what Tim is saying that there's a whole lot we don't know. Um, I don't feel like I could, I, I don't want to send the message that, you know, option A is what we think is the best and that's what it's gonna be. Uh, I feel a lot more comfortable with, <clears throat> To me, the big distinction is one of these has single family homes and the others don't. That's that's the thing that's really jumping out at me. And so it would be, I think it would be helpful if the city council were to say we would prefer to see development that does not involve single family homes or that does. But other than that, kind of locking into this is how it's going to look, this is the way the roads are going to go and all of that. I mean, I do understand that that's not that that you're not proposing that it definitely be this way but because the the drawings keep showing up looking like this then that is what it seems like we're saying we want so i'm just so i'm i'm feeling kind of uncomfortable with saying yes this is what we want i would be more comfortable with kind of sticking with what the the basic goals are and um or some other representation of this that doesn't seem like it's kind of putting some putting the cart before the horse in the way. Yeah, Carrie, I um, I hear you, and I think one of the tensions we've been struggling with on this is, um, I mean, Tim's word of progress report is is kind of a better one because it talks about it being this. I mean, nomenclature is hard, right? I mean, it's just hard for folks to. Everyone's got a different interpretation, different definitions of these. But we are we have been talking about this as phase one, with the implication that there's going to be many phases of this. So many phases of the work, many phases of the iterations of this work. And so you know, this is coming out of phase one. Yes, it's a progress, kind of a point in time. But to to Councillor Bates' point, um, without a visual without a, a we got a lot of feedback from the community in the fall i don't have anything to respond to i don't know what i'm i don't want to talk about this without without anything to respond to so you know you have this tension of how do you represent what the goals could look like in the abstract and more definitively and this is the tension i'm very sensitive to which is the very specific um tactical piece that we need to one of the early steps needs to be going to talk about permitting what's feasible here what are the implications what are the costs what are the um the steps that we would be facing in a if if this were the plan because the city's obligation is to clear some of those hurdles because without it a developer's not I don't want to. I don't want to touch this thing <laughs> without knowing a little bit more about what the agencies and what Act 250 might say. And you can't go to them without showing them what the impact could look like. Again, what the city would do is kind of take this a few more steps, get some clearance, initial clearance on a preliminary plan, with the full understanding that a developer would come in, fine tune it, and revise that, just like you see. A private developer, um, a private landowner might do that and do a concept plan for their site, and then individual homeowners come back and make further refinements and, and come back and amend their permits to show the exact design of their house. So, you know, you really want to um, get some due diligence under your belt here and do the work because that's the point of the economic development. That's the added value you can add for getting the type of developer to the table that you want, but you can't really do that without a plan to respond to. So again, I think when I say nomenclature, something that could be very valuable from this conversation from this group, and it could be something that follow, I don't know, product protocol or process, but disclaimers on this paper <laughs> are really helpful that could be you know we keep saying concept plan um we keep saying you know hypothetical throughout the document and things but maybe there is a a stronger footnote or bold note um somewhere on the plan that really differentiates it to be fair this plan is going to be one page out of like 30 of this document and not going to be the focal point but so far people respond to pictures so that has been part of the community conversation it's just a really high, high fine balance that we find ourselves in bill so i'm trying to listen to the concerns and have followed the process and un, you know understand kind of how we got to where we are i'm trying to think if i can help frame where we might be that in a place that people couldn't 
rally around. So it's my understanding, and I, I, I'm, anyone correct me, that the reason that the the housing portion is clustered where it is in part because of the natural, you know, it can't really be anywhere else, right? I mean, logistically. I mean, it could be closer to the front, but it can't be. So, so okay, that helps. So it sounds like then we have, we, we well, I'm going to state this as though we have agreement on these things, and then that could be the discussion. It sounds like there's general agreement between the community and the group here that we want the highest reasonable density that we can get for the site. That, that seems to be a goal. That it, I think there might be agreement that the recreation area is where it is and it is the size that it is. And that the housing would be roughly in the, the area that's laid out and that's because of the physical attributes of the site and that we would want to see a financing plan that covered the infrastructure costs um, you know using TFR grants or whatever whatever is out there um, so that if the city were to create the infrastructure we'd want to not necessarily do that you know and then and so you know th these plans that are drawn could be illustrative so so we've got the goals that I think we all agree on. So we've got the goals, we've got a general area for housing, general area for rec, we've got a, a financing goal, and then illustrative of those goals might be concepts like this, but these aren't the final concepts, is if that makes any sense. And if people, then if people don't agree with where the housing is, or that we should have rec land, or you know maybe it's the city ought to invest taxpayer money in this to try to buy down housing costs. I mean, those are all policy decisions. But from, from so I'm just throwing that out there. It's maybe a way to help figure out something we can get behind that isn't locked in or no one's concerned that it's over, Stated. you, you over know, specific. Over, over specific, but also I think it can't continue to be vague either. Uh -huh. So you're suggesting. You know what I mean? I'm saying like, yeah. yes, we, we support uh -huh. a, a high density housing. Uh -huh. In this general area, we support rec, you know, and we get a sense of what that uh -huh. might look like, but subjects change. Uh -huh. We support some sort of rec or public facility here. Uh -huh. All this other, uh, all these other goals are important to us. Yep. And if all possible, we want to have a self-financing infrastructure cost. Right. And but then you've got your plan, which yeah. says, here's how you get all those things. Right. Here's the, all the things you need to right. do. We've heard from your public that gave you your parameters. Here's the steps now that, that you got to do. You got to do your permitting. You got to yep. do your par partnership. You got to do your zoning. You've got to do your detailed cost estimates. You've got to do all these things mm -hmm. to get to those goals. Aren't you suggesting though that that you in that case you would incorporate all three as just illustrations? Uh, I'm going to just stop right there. Okay, <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was the idea. Go ahead, Tim. My take is general concept, okay. Um, but I still think I look at like the rec zone and the leg that goes back down toward Route 2. I'm still not willing to give up the potential for some housing before you get to the building. I know you don't like it because you think people have to drive by direct thing and Donna Bay said, okay. But if you knew that there was a $750 million price tag tied to that, if you brought that. a developer in that. that would offset the cost to get up that hill, then we should designate it for housing and not for rec. But that's a decision you'll make in the process of the actionables. As long as people understand we have that flexibility. That's yes. really what I want. Because yes. And then the next step is let's get the engineers in. I mean, they're working for us, I guess, through White and Burke. Um, we need to get the rest of this is just hot mm -hmm. air until we get some of those numbers and what's really got to happen. Um, and, and Bill, I thought you made a good point. The, the, one, the one question that I have, and uh, is whether the we think the community agreement is really the highest density or the highest number of units uh, with the goal being having having a target of around 300 um maybe more rather than what the density yeah, would be keep I, that's keeping the idea or a target of around 300 units and um 
because open space is important to people, you know, be looking at in the ballpark of 80 percent uh, open space. Donna. But, but if you get that specific, that I guess I'm still open to more density if when if we get somebody creative that shows us mm -hmm. that we can have higher density and still have those other goals. Mm -hmm. I agree. So I'd rather not stick with numbers. I see the public saying no to single housing for sure, as I did. Uh, and maybe so I'm biased on that one. But I just see them looking for the density and that they're going to be sharing the outside. Hmm. That's all. And I think one of the, where that might factor in is in the design and writing of the RFP itself. Um, that you'll have that decision point to not specify to specify or not specify the number of units that's the target for a developer to bring forward and rather focus it. so at that time you'll have more information from the permitting from the financing and the the um, I'm sorry not the financing the engineering and the, the number the cost associated with those things so you'll have more information by the time it gets to that point so I wouldn't put the specificity into the goals of the master plan at this point it the numbers will be reflected in the this is the concept that you know had a general support and that will be in the findings but rather stick with the goals that are more broad and let the RFP kind of get more specific if you want to at that time which you'll have another conversation and process around that's probably a year out at a minimum mm -hmm. so yeah. and to be clear i'm thinking 300 or more i'd of yeah. course like to see <laughs> see it be more sure. but sure. Uh, so sorry. people want to live in montpelier yeah yeah um and so since you're asking us for something like some direction um i don't know if you're hearing enough about what you <laughs> what you want to do to you do think you're step. do you think you're hearing enough um. well there there's the question and, and i do think it, if someone had a motion i recognize we have not had any uh, comment from the public yet and i want to open that up to comment from the from the public so why don't we do that and then maybe some members of the council will think they have uh, the framework of a motion in mind. Diane Sherman, you're you're up first. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, yes, thank you. So my name is Diane Sherman. I'm uh, the chair of the housing committee, and the housing committee met actually yesterday to talk about the three concepts before you. And you know the members didn't have the benefit of hearing this conversation, so I'm going to keep my comment short and also um, sort of explain a little bit about their position. What we talked about was um, urging you all to go forward with concept A um, if you are considering among the concepts, but for reasons that would also support if you choose not to vote on the concepts, generally supporting the idea of proposing um, going forward with goals or proposal that would focus on more uh, physically connected, dense, affordable housing, such as apartment buildings and townhouses, and leave single family homes for other parts of the city. We believe that's important because it's harder to develop, tends to be harder to develop large scale apartment buildings in, in Montpelier and in established neighborhoods. And also the city's housing stock is already predominantly single family homes. Um, by adding more units, as many as possible, which is one of the other major reasons we support concept A among those before you, it will it should help reduce cost pressure on the housing market throughout the city. Um, we also liked that the data provided by White and Burke shows that concept A is actually the best for the city's finances, as well as taxpayers. Um, And so just to just to summarize and go back to this point, I think where the housing committee would love to see you go is to promote the goals and approach that would create the most units in a, in a dense area. Obviously, there uh, we're also in support of sustainable approaches to that um, and would like to see the plan at the end of the day include reliable public transportation to this area and also um, would, in, you know, believe having more dense housing will actually create the kind of need and demand for public transportation that would support transportation to that area that is public. Um, would also urge you to, to, you know, really do focus on apartment buildings and townhouses and other ways to keep units hopefully more affordable um, 
and the housing committee largely assumes and 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 desires that a large portion of the housing built there will be affordable to households of low and moderate income. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. Any other members of the public? I'm not seeing any hands raised on, on Zoom, so I see Richard Brock has his hand up. Why don't you come on up? Where would you like me, Mr. Mayor? How about right up here at the microphone? Uh, if you'd rather sit down, you could do oh, that, no, but fine. those seats are taken. So um, you can make the pregnant lady move, Richard give up Brock. her seat. <laughs> uh, I think I know most of you. Um, my most important goal for tonight has just been met. You know we're here. I wanted to make sure of that, and I, I, I attempted to send you all a letter, and my uh, computer skills are such that I thought it might be important to be here and make sure that you received it. <laughs> um, and I also wanted to uh, be available if anybody has any questions. It's been, it's been a privilege, actually, to work on this interesting, exciting, and very large project. But we're such a small t atom of concern in this project that I didn't want to be overlooked. And so uh, going forward, I now know that the council knows we're here and knows what we'd like. And I also think it's important that we all understand that if we were to be granted access, that's your decision. It's not a decision of developers somewhere or your wonderful staff. And both Ms. Clark and Mr. Jerome have, ha have indicated general support for our concept, but they can't grant it to us, I believe, unless I misunderstand the situation. Granting it would be the prerogative of this council. So well, at the moment we own the land, so we, that's right. we decide what happens, right? <laughs> and so to this is a capitalist economy. Um, <laughs> are there any questions? Is well, there any let me just clarify, and, and I got your email, and I had a chance to take a quick look at it, but not in great detail. My understanding is that you're an abutting property owner, and you might want to develop your land and have having access to the infrastructure that's being developed on this land would be uh, would be beneficial to you is that a fair statement exactly and and what's on the other side of your land what's on the other side yeah i don't understand the question could you like rephrase it from 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 this property and we get to your land is uh oh, do you, above it yeah uh, the hackamore road development oh okay and so are you landlocked now? No, we have an easement for access. It's about 1,133 feet long. And it washed out completely in Irene, and it's right in the backyard of some people whose lives I don't want to disturb. And this would be a better access if the council were disposed to give it. Gotcha. And so you would... Your uh, easement would eventually get people out to Downhill Road. Oh, yes. We, okay. we can get there anytime we want, and we do from time to time. Gotcha. Any members of the other members of the council have questions? All right. Thanks for coming. Well, before I go, uh, yeah. uh, my wife, who's a member of this, the ownership of this property is somewhat complicated. There's some trusts and but we're all related. You know, we all have Thanksgiving together. Which makes it more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, she wanted to point out, I think, that uh, I'm just the one with the willingness to stand up and open my mouth. So. And thank you very you, much. for you, you can come on up and speak, too. Come on up. Well, you, you and your sister own oh. Okay. Thank you for your time. And uh, by the way, I have enjoyed working with Ms. Clark and Mr. Jerome. I think they're doing a great job for you. Good night. Thanks. Good to see you. Thank you. All right. Is there any other member 
of the public. Yeah. Any other member of the public online who uh, hasn't been recognized yet who wants to be? If not, I heard someone mention the possibility of a motion. Is there a motion? Tim? You? To move um, the completion of phase one of the Country Club Road process, that we endorse the goals um, as stated in the White and Burke report on pages five and six um, to move forward with the project. And that, uh, you know, me, I'd like to encourage that we uh, also it, I don't start do the RFP process or get the engineering work going. So at the next now. meeting, the deep, the, the, yep. the, that follow-up plan is going to be presented. So at ju June, our June 26th meeting yes. or whatever day? Uh -huh. June 14th, actually. Okay. Right. June 28th, sorry. Yes. Two meetings from now, sorry. Okay. Is there a second? So that's when that would be I done. I'll, I'll second it, but I just want to verify that what Tim has worded in the motion will get you to what you need to do but for the June meeting? I'm going to include Casa Tay anyway, I guess. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I think it would be helpful to have some more spe specificity um, to do a friendly amendment to, to specify which drawing would be most uh, consistent with your intentions around the goal to be illustrative only. So just insert that. And, and well, and Tim doesn't like any of the drawings. So I know. <laughs> right. Wait, wait. Option A, but it's the best one of the three. So illustrative maybe go only. with the concepts, <laughs> but not illustrational. The yeah, illustrative only and with appropriate disclaimers. Well, now now we have to go to our clerk. Okay, what do you now, need, John? I don't have that much budget. I, I, I think I can cobble that together. Yeah, I to, that's impressive. I have the notes, <laughs> but I think I'll probably return to the the tape for the specific wording. But I've got it. Okay. okay. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any uh, discussion uh, among the council? Are you ready for a vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. The motion carries. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stephanie. You um, will not see me on June 28th. You will see Dave Saladino. Um, and Josh, and I will see you all if you ever choose to hire us again. Uh, <laughs> so you'll see me after that. Well, since this wraps up your participation yes, before the uh, council, I just want to say it's been great. You've, Thank you. you've done great work uh, right along, much. and other members of the public who I've talked to have uh, made that same observation. Um, I'm glad to hear it. And good luck. Thank you. Weeks. I'll, um, I'll have another Vermonter to add to our, our population base. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> Thanks so much. Before you're on your way out the door. Okay. If we, if we connected Mr. Brock's property yeah. and they developed it, would those properties count in the TIF? Yeah. Hire me in September. There we go. <laughs> all right. We, we are up to. Item number 13, uh, Chapter 11, Ordinance Changes, Change, uh, First Reading. Chief, come on up. Those are a couple tough acts to follow again. Um, <laughs> hello, thanks uh, for having me again. Uh, first reading for an ordinance change, kind of th to recap from the last meeting. Um, we were looking, based on some police review committee uh, recommendations to look at some of our existing ordinances and and uh, either change the penalties or abolish them um, so what we what we did was made some recommendations to change some penalties um, I got with the police review committee um, they liked the, the revisions that we had and uh, we created a policy and also a standard operating procedure for how we would handle uh, public drinking and also other chapter 11 uh, violations so our goal was to decriminalize those uh, violations and turn them into civil tickets which are prosecutable by us and uh, I think the wording has been shared with all of you folks so if you had any specific questions for me I'd be happy to answer those but anybody uh, anyone on uh, online um, I uh, w one question I had I, I'm looking at the 
public up intoxication and intoxicant consumption policy is that the policy statement says while intoxication and substance abuse are illnesses and do we really think that intoxication <laughs> standing by itself is an illness i realize that policy is not what we're reviewing today but i thought that was an interesting question sure i think there was some definitions involved with mm -hmm. that um if you want some different wording, I'm happy to entertain that. Okay, that's for sure. Yeah. We don't have to do that tonight. Or do we need to say that at all? Well, well it's not part of the ordinance, okay. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Carrie. Yes. Um, okay. So I'm looking at the memo um, about this, and I see that there's a proposal to add uh, section 1 9, which is the um, you know, outlines the procedures and what happens if someone violates these. That's all nice and clear to me. The part that I'm wondering about is above that in the memo, the suggestion is to remove completely or remove from police penalties these other sections, um, curfew, advertising, and smoking within city parks. And so I just want to kind of clarify what we're having a first reading on right now because that, that part is unclear to me, whether we're talking about removing them completely or leaving them in there and just having them not be subject to the penalties that are specified later on below. Oh, thank you. First off, uh, I open the public hearing. Thank you, Clerk. Mm -hmm. I always used to do the lot so councillor brown uh, thanks for the question uh, it started out was we were initially addressing the public drinking ordinance and then we decided to have a more broad discussion um, with the rest of chapter 11 um, because a lot of those kind of made sense to turn them into civil penalties uh, dealt with by a, a municipal ticket um, a couple of the things we talked at last meeting were that we didn't really want the police to deal with the curfew advertising and smoking in city parks. So I, I took those off of police penalties. Um, I don't think you want us issuing tickets for those violations. Um, you're welcome to keep those on the books and we can have conversations with people, but I don't have a lot of interest in issuing tickets to people past nine o'clock. Um, question on the table, I'm paraphrasing for everybody, is whether would actually be removing those entire ordinance provisions or just the penalty provision is that right and that would be up to you folks if it, it, your prerogative i i don't have a lot of interest in enforcing those and if you want to remove them i would support that so uh, if i could follow up yeah keep um, going carrie so this is really a procedural question i'm trying to get clear on um do we need a motion to um, make a change to the ordinance, and then we have first reading and you know second reading and public hearings on it. Well, so normally what you do is you'd have the public hearing on a proposal, and I and I I, I get you where, where you're at. I mean, we're not actually saying we're kind of giving it either the or instead of having here's a proposal to have a public hearing. So I think the cleanest thing was after we discussed the concepts is make a motion of what you want to approve to move to second reading for. The, okay. the final version the first reading is usually where we flush these things out and then it does go to a second reading and that should be you know it could still be amended at second reading too but I, the idea is that that's really more of a public hearing this is what we're what the council after first reading thinks it wants to do gotcha yeah go ahead Carrie. okay but in that case i i would be in favor of removing the uh the, the other the parts of the ordinance about curfew and advertising and um whatever the other one was smoking so that that's what i would like to see go to a second reading is that we eliminate those as well as adding in this the clarified enforcement procedures so is that your motion um sure <laughs> okay should so i restate it does that work for the clerk W would you please restate it? You probably want to close yeah, sorry. The meeting before you have the meeting, the here, the vote motion. Thank you. Um, in that case, I will see if there's any member of the public who wishes to be heard. And please raise your hand on Zoom if you do. Uh, we, I think we're going to have to do 
we'll get there. Okay, I'll do it again. Okay, not not seeing any uh, hands raised for any request by member of the, pu of the public to be heard. I will close the public hearing, and uh, then Councillor Brown, would you restate your motion, please? Yeah, um, I move that we remove the specified sections from the ordinance that are in the memo and that we add a new section 1-9 as written in the memo. Is there a second? Okay, seconded by Councillor Haney. Uh, any further discussion by members of the council? If not, all those signify in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. All right. And then at the next meeting, the, the drafted ordinance with these things will be on for second reading. Once you adopt Great. those, then they become effective however many days, 10 days or whatever it is. Yep. Right. All right. Great. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. What? Hearing. Do we have to make a motion to set the second hearing? No. Okay. Just well, we have in the past, but we know when it's going to be. So. All right, next Does up. Would you like to make a motion no, for clarity? You love it, so I'm asking. <laughs> next sometimes up. It's not as clear as others. We I have, only I, want it when there's lack of clarity. Mm -hmm. There's clarity. We were pretty clear tonight. I just rolled it. <laughs> next up, we're up to <laughs> item number 14 <laughs> uh, night paving. Uh, Hello. Welcome, Corey. I don't know what happened. Somebody uh, has to be last, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so Corey Line with Public Works. Good to see everyone again. Um, this is a waiver for the uh, couple different paving projects. One is the Agency of Transportation, Route 2, Route 302 project. Um, specifically, uh, this work will occur on Route 2 from Bailey Avenue, including Bailey Avenue, out to the Berlin Town Line um, out by Gallison Hill as well as Route 302 from the roundabout out to the uh, Wayside Town Line. Um, the work specifically for nighttime will include the milling and removal of the existing asphalt and the placement of the new asphalt. Um, the milling is scheduled to occur at the end of June. It'll last approximately two to three weeks. And the final pavement is scheduled to occur um, at the end of August and will last a couple weeks. Uh, on that end. Um, so important to note on this one, um, ever since the early planning stages for this project, it was anticipated that this work would happen at night, mostly because the last time this project happened, it started, it got a couple days in, they realized that the impacts were not sustainable during the day. Um, so they had to go through the process of changing to night work after the project had started using a change order process, added a lot of time, a lot of cost, in order to get ahead of it, it was planned that this, this work would occur at night. Um, the second project is the State Street paving. Um, this is associated with the utility work that is currently happening out there now. Uh, once that utility work is done, it'll be patched in asphalt, but uh, later on afterwards, we wanna come in and do one curb to curb paving, no seams, uh, make it look nice. Um, that, that is going to take both both processes. It, the whole thing will take a couple of nights. It'll probably be on so, on continuous nights. Um, there might be one in between, one night in between. Uh, but that one will go pretty quick. Um, I feel like there was something else I wanted to mention, but uh, I don't think there's. Okay. Done. So the one on. State Street, is that also the one that the Capitol Plaza was asking for some, making sure that the noisier stuff was done earlier? So from what I understand, I wasn't part of that meeting, but from mm -hmm. what I understand, um, that was specifically for some of the subsurface utility work, um, and this is for the paving. Okay. Yeah, same project, okay. different, same different project. activities, same project. Thank you. Okay. 
anticipated that work would yes. be done before this meeting. As it turned out, I don't think it has been, but because of other problems. But I, I believe it may be occurring right now. Oh, maybe it's occurring I, right I, now. I, I don't know, know for sure. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah, I'd heard it might be tonight, so yeah. maybe we could go. I'll go over and watch after the meeting. <laughs> 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 All right. Any? Uh, oh, any? oh. Uh, sorry. The um, we did state that we we sent out uh, notices per the ordinance. I believe it's every it's uh, 200 feet, maybe 250 from the project area. Um, so we sent out those notices. Uh, we said we would report any comments that we received. We did not receive any comments. All right. Any uh, comments from the public? Uh, Mark Seltzer or Kate, Bol Kate Bolter. Hi there. Um, we are residents on the Route 2 corridor. Um, uh, River Street and Pioneer Street area. Um, and we're wondering just what the notification plan would be for neighbors so that we can kind of plan around closing windows and, and protecting ourselves from the sound and dust that might be involved with the project. So the, the notification, um, obviously the city's outlets will all um, send something out when there's a hard date of when it's gonna, when it's gonna start. And as it can, as it proceeds through, um, the other thing that'll happen is the portable message boards in the area will be switched over to indicate what that date is and uh, when it will start. Corey, just to follow up on behalf of the the questioner, it this is going to roll down the street, right? So there's a start and finish date, but I think one question might be: Do we, when we know we're approaching certain neighborhoods, will we be able to provide people information, or is there a place like would that be on the city's website, or like where could people go if they know it's coming up to them in the next couple nights? Yeah, I think that could be managed through the city's. Uh, what the, okay. there's a project website on the city's, right. uh, there's a project page on the city's website, um, and um, I know we've been getting out. Uh, notices on the social media outlets. So okay. I, I think that can be managed as it proceeds. Right. We're doing and this could, block and this night. And can people this call the DPW night, office yeah. too if they really yeah. do? Okay. And presumably this is also going out in the uh, DPW newsletter. Right. Which I recognize not everyone's going to sign up for it, but if you want to pay attention to what your city government is doing, DPW and city manager newspapers or newsletters are an excellent source of information. Uh, do you have another question, or is this is Mark? A uh, quick question. I know on the uh, State Street project, uh, when we were driving by a couple nights ago, we heard uh, loud pumps and loud generators that were running um, through the project. Uh, is that expected to happen for this, or is it just going to be uh, vehicles uh, milling and doing that, or will there be any uh, incessant noises from generators, pumps, or anything of that sort? So, so all of that static work, the stationary work. Um, we don't expect any pumps at all in this project, but um, things like adjusting the manholes and the valves, that could um, result in some jackhammering. That is all expected to be done during the day. This is continuously moving, um, milling, hauling away, and then uh, paving later on. All right, thanks. Um, any other member of the public who wishes to be heard? All right, um, Chair would entertain a motion to approve this request. I move that we approve the waiver to the ordinance. And is there a second? Second. All right, moved by Bate, seconded by Brown. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And anyone opposed? All right, we've adopted the waiver. Thanks, Corey. Thank you. Now we're up to other business, and under other business, we have a discussion of a city council retreat. I ask that you put on the agenda because I would like us to discuss a retreat that's off site, that we really have a chance to learn a little more about one another and how we make decisions and function uh, much more than city matter directly, more about us as individuals. And so I bounce around some ideas of other places we might meet. Uh, one that came up, I think that Jack mentioned, was the 
one of the shelters in the park. Um, I think it's a great idea. I, I think we should do it. I think that, uh, you know, we've been working together for a couple of months now, uh, getting some non-task direct directed time is a great idea. It, of course, would ha still have to be open to the public, but uh, I don't know how many members of the public are interested in watching us uh, sit around and eat pizza. Right, but it's really about, the, I mean, the public can certainly attend and you have your public comment period, but it's really about the council speaking. It's right. not about a lot of public participation. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, last, I, I believe Mary was looking at finding a date for it, and that's always the biggest challenge is, um, you know, I tossed out next week, but um, you're, you're away. Uh, I'm away and, for two and weeks. I don't know about the first week in, in week in June. Maybe that's uh, that's next week. Well, I meant next oh. week, but it was actually be May thirty first is next Wednesday. Uh huh. Um, June seven. You know, our next council meeting is the fourteenth. Our regular meeting. Well, is is everybody in agreement we should do this? Why don't we just yeah. Yeah. say yeah? Have Mary. I think we already had a head nod that we were going to do it. Okay. Yeah. So, so we'll find it. Date first and then a place. Oh, you're gone the seventh too, though, right? I'll be back the eleventh. I'm gone okay. until the eleventh. All right. Okay. So it'll probably be after the eleventh, I would imagine. Well, I I will be gone from the fourteenth until early July. I'll be gone for like three weeks. Can so can we have it after summer? Because everybody is having vacation, I won't be here June six, between June six and fifteen. Then I have a vacation last two weeks of June. Then we are planning to go to Turkey for the first time after COVID July. So it is really um, kind of busy. <laughs> so is it possible if we can do it like Does I don't know September happen? or? Yeah, May. <laughs> we may have we may have no choice, and I don't think yeah. we'll be able to get it in during May. So well, maybe we can, Mary August. can. We can do it in Martha's Vineyard or Turkey. <laughs> uh, You're welcome down here. Yeah, if you let me go Turkey, I will bring some food for you. Sir. Well, can we can we meet in Istanbul or something? Could we all go? <laughs> no, why not? Let's go together. Then we can have a retreat there. Great. <laughs> Let, that's right let let's um all right we'll work on rely that. on city staff the to, to come up with the a with date. the timing and it'll probably involve communication with the council members to see when they're available right all right next up city council reports um starting down on with uh councillor bait boy i want to see all you people back next meeting it's really bare around here like <laughs> you're missed um, I just want to mention that the infrastructure committee talked about a bike loan program that has been going on, and they're looking for people who are interested in being part of it. They got several e-bikes and some regular bikes given to them, hmm. and they'd like to recreate it this summer. But they do need volunteers to do it. So if you're interested, contact me, both council members and citizens. Cool. And that's all you've got? Yep. Uh, Carrie? Uh, no report tonight. Uh, Sal? Uh, I, I just want to say that I appreciate the work that um, the city managers of Montpelier, Berry, and Berlin are doing to try and help us um, meet the uh, motel exit uh, emergency. I, I know progress is difficult and slow, but I'm still hopeful that we'll come up with something. So, But thanks for that effort. I really appreciate it. What you're doing. Thanks, Sal. Uh, Tim? Uh, Palin? Uh, it's not from our city, but I just read that Burlington approved non US uh, citizen voting, which we already did. So I think it's a great development now. Vinsky, Burlington, Montpelier have approved, and it shows that we are becoming more inclusive um, state. So it's a good news. Thank you. Great, and it looks like we don't have Lauren uh, anymore. Um, mayor's report, I, uh, 
I don't have much except to observe that I think that people are, um, I think we've done a lot of work. We, If you look at what our uh, agendas have been like lately, there's been a lot of uh, very information heavy stuff that we've dealt with. I thought the discussion of the water system uh, a couple of meetings ago was an excellent discussion. The uh, discussions tonight were excellent discussions. So. Thumbs up, especially for the new people who have been trying to catch up for with all this stuff that uh, the rest of us have been had on our in our minds for a long time. Um, it's it's a lot of work. Um, City clerk's report. Um, I just need to mention that we did not have a critical mass of live city council folk here to sign all the things that needed to be signed. So I will um, be putting that over, I guess in the, I'll just leave it over in the manager's office and, um, or I can just hang on to it. I'll have it at the clerk's office. Why can't I have it in my office? So if folks could get a chance to uh, come on by and sign these, that would be great. We need one more uh, at least, right? Yeah, one more would give us majorities on things of okay. the council, so we'd be good if, if even just one of you, you can make it. You can your mask and come in. <laughs> great. Montpelier and just not feeling well. Yes. <laughs> missing the meeting, and your initials are Sal Alfano. <laughs> you can just put your mask on and come down and sign. <laughs> All right, and city manager's report. Um, just a couple things. Uh, we started, uh, so the reappraisal is still in uh, full swing. Um, we are in the midst of the first round of, of grievance hearings. It's been a city, uh, not grievance, excuse me, the informal. Uh, meetings they seem to be going pretty well uh, you know it's been a full schedule but we have not knock wood we've not had the same kind of a sort of um, I don't know if negative is the right word or uh, vocal reaction that we've had people seem to be you know going through the process and asking the right questions and do you know making their points but it it seems to be going relatively smoothly um, I asked just it is interesting though as you know talking about housing um, the average single family home in Montpelier as of this room I mean it will change slightly when they're done but right now it's four hundred eighteen thousand dollars now up from what a 220 or whatever it was and the average condo is about 280 condo in my building went for 315 yeah. just two weeks ago yeah yeah mm -hmm. so it's it's <laughs> 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 exactly so I mean it's it's just a, a, a you know it's we're in a new time secondly uh, on the other end of that spectrum uh, we had another meeting of our homelessness coalition tonight uh, we don't really have an official name for it but it is the three cities and the nonprofit providers and now the state um, you know we're a week out from the first group uh, coming out uh, I think this group has really uh, worked hard at coming up with some sort of specific plans about what who's going to be where doing what on june 1st and 2nd as far as whether it's just providing rides and those kind of things we've got a list we've submitted a list to the state of uh issues to be funded uh, i think we're optimistic that many things so one of the good things so, so the the problem we have is unique in that there's actually a lot of money available to address it. There's about $10 million right now in the budget for short term. This is about 26 short term solutions, about 26 million in the state budget for what they call medium term type fixes, and over $100 million for sort of housing development, affordable housing programs for a longer term. Um, the problem is there's right now there's no housing and no specific place and no shelter capacity. Uh, and not a lot of people to staff these things. So, um, you know, it's it's kind of the opposite of where we normally are. We have people who are ready, willing, and able, but no money. This is just kind of a backward situation. But, but there are some good suggestions being made. But I do think that the the cold reality is uh, there will be no place for a lot of people to go uh, next week and then next month, uh, other than camp uh, in places that maybe they should or shouldn't be. But we are looking at that. We are. Uh, Good Samaritan is uh, looking at a couple of options for sheltering, uh, expanding some sheltering capacity. They're, they're handling those negotiations, um, but they say that looks promising. 
Um, and I think mostly we've really, you know, we've, we've got a sense of what could work, including um, some infrastructure that might be, um, even though it might be short-term money, it could have longer-term benefit, you know, bathrooms, for example, uh, something that might be able to be funded. So, you know, maybe we could put some funds toward a public bathroom under the short-term money. Um, and the good news is a lot of the things we thought that we might have to fund um, may well be eligible, is likely to be eligible under this money. So, you know, whether we thought we might have to put money in a retrofit someplace to be a shelter. And this is something actually the state might cover. Um, so so um, that's good. But it's not good for the folks that are going to be uh, out of a home next week. Is there any time limit on funds that are available as to when they have to be well, spent? technically it's, you know, the next fiscal year for the state. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know if they can commit them and use them. And we actually talked about, uh, and, and so there is a state representative here. We talked to the key funding person yesterday. She couldn't make it to the meeting today, but so the guy was there was going to take some questions back. One of the questions was, for example, can you, um, let's say there was a, we needed to lease a place for shelter. You know, could we, could we sort of prepay a three year lease? type thing you know maybe get a better deal if someone takes the money up front now um, but at a you know lower monthly rate over a period of time but then that would lock a place down for shelter for three years while we sorted out the other options you know more permanent options um, so they were going to check on all that you know the, the, the general feedback we got from the state is be as creative as you can give us your list they've put out the state's put out a request for ideas uh, June by June one, our our group had already sent ours in before they released the, uh, and they told us that we had already met the requirement before they even sent it out. Okay. So, we felt good about that. So, you know, it's been a great working group. It's really a bunch of committed people. We'll be meeting again next uh, Wednesday uh, for two basic purposes: to prioritize our funding requests and to, you know, basically night before the storm, see what last minute planning is in place. And then we'll decide after that whether we need to keep meeting weekly or what, you know, it's been very large turnouts at these meetings, much more than we ever expected. And so do we try to shrink it down to a working group or something? But uh, so one more big group meeting. And uh, um, Barry's outreach worker, Brooke Paul Pooley Outworks is kind of an embedded social worker with their, their police department, I guess. She's volunteered to sort of be this, the coordinator for this next week agencies so there's a single person for, for those groups to work with so and Kelly was involved with the meeting as well we had Chief Gowans Chief Nordenson can, can you use that money to actually buy a place and turn it into a shelter potentially not, not just directly housing I mean you know it's one of those things right that so yes, yes. and yes. there's a statewide's worth of requests that will be coming in Yep, yep. And you know, ten million dollars is a lot of money, but it's not, in certain, you know, it's not. Yes. Yeah, it's a huge need. Yep. It's not infinite, so I think the question is going to be, you know, what are the priorities? What are the biggest banks for the buck? So we, you know, one hand we're trying to find things that will help people immediately, but also if we can do that and set ourselves up for, you know, a longer term solution. So that's where that's at. So a lot going on. Thanks, Bill. Your leadership on this effort has been uh, one of the things that's really made this work. And at uh, 1017, we will be adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.